Right, good afternoon everybody. If we could, uh, if we could draw ourselves to, um, to our places. Okay, is everybody okay? Right. Welcome everyone to this afternoon's um, meeting of the Tourism, Development and Culture Committee. Uh, I, before we start, I think we're going to ask, the, the amendments have come very late and I'm not sure if, um, does anybody want 15 minutes to read them or are you okay? What, do you want to take a break later on in proceedings? So, so we'll make a start and then if we want to, if you feel you need a, a break before it comes, just say and we can, we can have a break. Good. But bearing in mind we all want to go home sometime this evening. Yeah, some of us were here till quarter to ten last night. Oh, it's actually your camp bed there in the corner, yeah. isn't it? Council McCafferty got off there. <laughs> we were right, well, it's it was good, poorly. Um, okay, right. So, are we okay to start? Right, and let's um let's welcome Councillor uh, Miller to the east. His first and last um, last occasion. Well, it may not be the last occasion. You may you may be here next time, but um, for this set, for this uh, for this round, it'll be the first and last time. But welcome very much, and uh, uh, hopefully everything go, goes well. Okay. Are there any declarations of substitutions? No. Does anyone de uh, wish to declare? Um, an interest in relation to any matters included on the agenda. Ah, oh, Councillor Norman. Thank you. Anne. Thank you, Chair. Um, not the key interest in item 75 and item 77, the Royal Pavilion Estate, as a trustee of the Royal Pavilion. Okay. Anybody else? No. Uh, moving on, we've got no part two item today, so the press and public won't be excluded, which I'm sure they'll all be very happy about. Uh, on to the uh, meeting to the previous meeting. Does the committee agree to approve the meetings of the previous meeting as a correct record? Very really good. And moving on to Chair's communications. This is the first bit of the whole afternoon. Um, in the last three months, Visit Brighton have worked uh, with over 545 city partners. They have generated three. Sorry, I've got someone there. Generated 300,000 euros worth of press coverage in Germany and over 200,000 pounds worth of coverage in the UK, including meetings and intensive travel magazines, The Telegraph, Ideal Magazine, Yahoo, and Suitcase, alongside the Visit Brighton. Uh, alongside this visit, visit Brighton one a warehouse social media campaign to mitigate the mainline railway closures. The Brighton Centre has submitted the proposals for 37 conference inquiries which have the potential of generating 14 million in income benefit. There are confirmed bookings for 15 new meetings and events including POMS conference with 200 delegates, Head and Neck Cancer Conference with 250 delegates, International Radioactivity Congress with 400 delegates, the TUC are coming in September 22 and 24 with 2,000 delegates, 475 bed nights of accommodation for conference clients has also been booked, generating four, it says four K commissions um, for uh, Brighton. Um, Visit Brighton. The Royal Pavilion, the, uh, the BA I360 and the Sea Life Brighton have been jointly promoting a rebranded multi-venue Explorer Pass with the support from Visit Brighton which has launched just before February half term. January saw the opening of the Elaine Evans Archaeological Gallery at Brighton Museum which has been receiving positive feedback from visitors. 
It has been developed in cooperation with schools to provide a resource for the delivery of early history and the Brighton Archaeological Society. One teacher said, my year, of five, my year five class were really buzzing when they visited the exhibition. We were in there for an hour and they retained their interest the whole time. An exhibition of hats by the milliner Stephen Jones can be seen at the Royal Pavilion until June the 9th, which includes designs worn by Lady Gaga and, and uh, Diana, Princess of Wales. The Royal Pavilion has, a long, has long been an inspiration for Jones, and many of these acts reflect, reflect the wonderful, whimsical nature of the Royal Pavilion, specifically his Spring and Summer 2012 collection. Material Practice 2, Painting and, and Printmaking, opened at Hove Museum and Art Gallery, which was an exhibition of final year students from BA Fine Art Painting and Fine Art Printmaking courses at the University of Brighton. This is the second time the museum has been showcasing students' work, and it can be seen till the 29th of, Feb uh, of April. And as Andrew's sitting in the uh, public gallery, I'd like to, to, to thank him, because I know he's had an awful lot to do with that, and it, uh, it really is inspirational for anybody who goes along to it. The Booth Museum celebrated International Day for Women and Girls in Science with a free discovery day. The Wonder Woman of STEM, Science, Maths, Engineering and Technology on Saturday the 16th of February. This attracted nearly 400 visitors and included a performance inspired by the, collect, uh, inspired by the collections by Hereford and Cardinal Junior, uh, Hartford and Cardinal Junior School children. At the Royal Pavilion and Museum, a local young person has joined for one, of the, one year's trainership to learn about digital skills in the museum sector. This is part of the Museum's Future Scheme run by the British Museum on the behalf of Heritage Lottery Fund. The RPM is offering work experience placements for eight young people from Longhill as part of the cultural hub with our future cities, same sky, the dome and fabrica this year, as well as offering placements at Patcham, St John's SEN School and Seahaven Academy. These will, be, these will take place in June and July. I have attended with Councillor Platt a positive meeting on improving access to the beach. Those present included representatives from COPE, supported by a project scheme from the Possibility People, together with Council officers. Whilst everyone acknowledges the challenges that the beach terrain presents with regard to accessibility, there is a strong desire to make improvements where possible. The priority of the stakeholders have been identified from community research and now structured into development phases. The meeting agreed a number of key actions for the, in the first instance, which will then be reviewed at the next meeting. These actions include a review of use of the beach wheelchairs, an assessment of the feasibility of a viewing platform in a quieter area, development of seafront accessibility map, and signage, and an access and an engineering audit to be undertaken of the seafront, an initial investigation of potential funding sources beyond that which can be accessed through the internal council resources or via Scope's local people programme. This work will now progress and a report will be provided to this committee at a later date to ensure that, it is an oversight, uh, that, the, that, that there is an oversight for this important issue. And I think that we all felt it was at that meeting that we really wanted this work to carry on and so beyond the life of this, the, the, the current committee. So that's why I've asked that we make a definite commitment within the uh, chair's, uh, chair's communications. Following the success of the bid of Brighton and Hove to be a host city for the UEFA Women's European Football Championships in 2021, it is great news that the England Lionesses match with New Zealand will take place at the Amex Stadium on June the 1st at 1pm. The game is England's final warm-up before they leave for the Women's World Cup in France. The match will give fans a chance to see the country's top players and give them a good send-off to the World Cup, where they will meet Scotland, Argentina and Japan. Well, I think they beat the other day, didn't they, Japan? Uh, in the group stages. Finally, I attended the Brighton and Hove Area Cricket Hub on Monday of this week, 
and it was good to meet everyone involved and inspiring to hear the work undertaken by the youth cricket participation and inclusion, particularly the potential for female participation. So I will now call upon the Democratic Service Officer who will undertake the call over and I ask that members will indicate those items they wish to receive on the agenda. Chair, the first item on the agenda is item 73, review of the provided Digital Party. Uh, item 74, Outdoor Event Strategy 2019-24. Item 75, update on Royal Pavilion Museum Advisory Group. Item 76, procurement of Brighton Centre hosted ticketing system. And item 77, major projects update. And therefore, all items on the agenda have been reserved for discussion. Okay, thanks very much. So now we move on to public involvement. Uh, and the first is a, a question for Mr. Hawtree regarding Hope Museum and Art Gallery. So if you'd like to come forward and present your question, Mr. Hawtree, thanks very much. Councillor Robbins, um, please tell us what steps he will be taking to ensure that the rooms on the ground floor of Hove Museum and Art Gallery are used to display paintings and drawings from the, the authority's reserve stock. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the question, uh, Mr. Walter. There, there are no current plans to use the ground floor temporary exhibition space for displaying paintings or drawings from the collections in store. Hope Museum and Art Gallery temporary exhibitions are displayed in these rooms and are programmed in line with the theme of making funding by the Arts Council and focus in encouraging young people, children and families. For example, in September, there was a show of local young people's work that had been worked with professional artists and museum staff to develop their creative skills and produce work inspired by the collections. The displays of paintings on the second floor are changed approximately every two years, bringing out pictures from the store, and there are plans to do so later in this year, should the RPM be successful in raising funds for a painting of local interest, which be, it would be displayed along other pictures of, uh, of, of the locality. The pictures in the Pocock room are changed occasionally. The displays in the Fine Art Gallery of Bright Museum are changed from time to time to show, showcase pictures from the collections in store. Bringing out the pictures from the collections in store, often conservation, framing and glaze work, often involves conservation, framing and glaze work. Um, do you have a supplementary? I just wonder if you're familiar with this huge um, catalogue, which is of just the oil paintings uh, in public ownership in um, East Sussex, published in 2005, I think. And mostly, and many hundreds, I think some 1,800 of them are here, belonging to this authority. And so, as such, rather than what you said, but on this evidence alone, would you not agree that it behoves you to make available such diverse work as to pluck to a random Dunning King and local artist Ida Werner to make them available to our town's residents who, many of themselves artists, were recently very keen to save the museum and are aghast to think that so much of what belongs to us is, in effect, confined to a lock-up in, excuse my language, New Haven. <laughs> Well, I don't know if anybody wants to defend New Haven, and maybe someone. If you'd said it about Port Slade, I'd have been across to you, but there we are. Nothing um, wrong with New Haven. I don't think we should talk down to New Haven. Oh, no. just, just a comment, really, query um, for Mr Hawtree, when his comments about New Haven. And I don't think it's appropriate that he should be citing an area where probably there are artefacts from this council, because that's not really appropriate. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mary, I don't understand. So are you saying I'm not being appropriate? No, no, no. You're saying Mr. Hawtree? Can I say it again? No, OK. OK. No, I was just questioning the fact that Mr. Hawtree mentioned New Haven, and I personally don't think it's appropriate that he should say to identify that particular place, Mr. Hawtree. 
Well, I, yeah, I'm sure there's. Yeah, uh, I understand. Yes, I understand. Yes, it, it, so yeah, I do understand, and, and, and quite right. It's um, it's perhaps not appropriate to identify where it is uh, publicly. And um, as, as far as the, the, the rooms we're talking of in Hope Museum going, as, as we're saying that they, they, they're used as temporary space, and I take it back to one of the items I, I, I gave in my chair's communications when I again thank um, Councillor Wes, where, where um, students from the University of Brighton were displaying their works and still displaying their works in that, those two galleries. And the, the, the tutors and students were saying to me when I went along there the other Friday at the opening how marvellous it was for them to actually be able to see their paintings in a, in a proper gallery. So, they, you know, it's all very well to see your painting. And, and some of these are, are, you know, the size of that doorway, massive paintings. If you see that in a, just in a, you know, in a, in a studio, it's not the same. When you see it lit and hung, hung on a wall in a, in a gallery, it's really something. So I think it's more appropriate that we use these for the, 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 the temporary works as they, are, as they are at the moment. So again, thanks very much for your question, Mr. Altry, but uh, that's the state of play at the moment. Thank you again. Uh, so moving on, we have um, a question from Julia Weeks. Ah, Julia, would you like to come forward and ask your question? We haven't spoken for about a day and a half, have we? God, nice, to, <laughs> nice to speak to you again. Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon. Put the wrong glasses on today. <coughs> Um, some Tourism Alliance members have publicly expressed their concern that the Council's preferred option one, this is in regard to Valley Gardens, in particular the removal of the pier roundabout in conjunction with creating what is now five lanes of two-way traffic, all to the east of the steam, will have a detrimental impact on tourism to the city. It's noted that the Chair of Tourism, Development and Culture did not raise any questions about this option at the Environment, Transport and Sustainability Committee. In order for me to share a balanced view with all Tourism Alliance members, could the Chair now state his reasons for supporting this particular option? Okay. Thanks very much for your question, Julia. Yeah, in my role as Chair of this committee, I've taken a keen interest in the connections between the development of Valley Garden Scheme as a whole and the city's in visitor economy. As a member of Environment, Transport and Sustainability quest, uh, Committee and my role as chair of this committee, I've been able to receive several detailed briefings on the development of the scheme, as well as feedback from several workshops held by organisations including the Tourism Alliance, bus companies, event organisers, taxi trade reps and others. So perhaps the, the question you should be asking is of the councillors who ask a lot of questions at the committee rather than myself not asking any questions because I'd attended all the briefings. But we'll carry on. In addition, I have personally met with a number of people and stakeholders, including the Palace Pier, Latest TV and the RPM, uh, and of course yourself, who uh, I've spoken to quite a few times over the last two months, and I'm sure we will talk lots more. Um, I'm also confident that the, the engagement meetings will continue with groups and individuals as the process moves through the detailed design stage. I cannot accept that the new designs will have a detrimental impact on tourism in the city. In fact, I believe that more people are likely to want to come, spend time in what will be the new destination area with fresh new gardens, better pedestrian access, easier arrival by bus and bike, plus easier and safer access to the seafront, the Lanes and St James's Street area. This will all support our tourism offer, not detract from it. Lots more public space will be created, offering opportunities for informal events, event use, as well as dedicated space for events that will, for the first time, be supported with a permanent inf infrastructure built into the gardens. This will give the city centre a new focus, something that has been sadly lacking for several years. Do you have a supplementary? I do, Chair. I'm not sure you've given me your reasons for supporting that particular scheme, but I will go. Oh, and I will. Um, so thank, 
you know, I, I, thank I, you for your response. I did, say, I did say the fact okay. I believe that more people are likely to want to come and spend time in what will be a new destination area. So that is my that's reasons for, for, for supporting it. Okay. No, that's fine. So I do have a supplementary question. Okay. Um, so, I mean, in terms of more public realm and stuff like that, clearly, you know, there are concerns that with their existing public realm perhaps that, and this isn't this, is, this truly isn't given to this administration so it's across the board it's not given to you chair or anybody it's a, it's a council thing that we're having to use you know methods like crowdfunding to maintain Madeira terraces we're having to use volunteers to maintain their parks we're having to use businesses to step in and work up at the station so I've, I've heard what you said in your, um, in your response to me, but so as the Chair of the Tourism Development and Culture Committee, and as such um, chosen to represent you know, the interests of the city's tourism, culture and event sectors, in order to come to your decision um, to support option one, approximately how many businesses, relevant organisations and individuals from these sectors did you personally meet with, engage with or seek views from that ultimately led you to conclude that this option was the correct one? Uh, well, approximately, um, I don't know. I mean, I can, I can have a tot up if you like and go back through my diary. Huh? Well, I've named three. The Palace Pier, Latest TV, the RPM. I think most of those were against the scheme. Well, they may be against it, but I've still met them. <laughs> <laughs> well, am I only supposed to meet people who are for it? I don't, I don't quite understand the question. I think it was how... From, from, do you, do you want to, sorry, Nick, were you going to speak? No, no. Um, I think I just want to know, obviously, with your decision that you made, and you had all the briefings from everywhere else and so on. So I believe most of the people you met with, including the Palace Pier, were actually against this project. So in terms of understanding how you concluded to vote for the project, apart from listening to the, obviously the papers and the offices and you know, wherever other things came from, who did you personally meet with that convinced you that this project from those sectors, the events people who are all saying that we might lose events, the tourism sectors, and, and truly, I know it sounds as if I'm being against this project, I am trying to present a balance to you on this. I think, I, I, as I say, I'm more than happy to meet you, Julia, and we can talk about this, but I don't know as... Um, singling out people that I met as being against it. I mean, if I meet people, I, you know, I don't know I had to meet people that were for it to be convinced of it. You know, perhaps my role was to convince their, those people of it. Um, and and that's, that's the way our discussions went. I don't believe I ever... Um, you know, went along and didn't listen. But at the same time, I, I've become convinced over a, a number of months that this is a good scheme. And, and, I, and I remain convinced. Um, so I, 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 on what? Well, I've answered my personal view on the administration's view. No, that's fine, honestly, Chair. Okay, all right then, Julie. Well, thank thanks you. for coming along. Thank thanks you very much. much. Okay, so we'll move on. Uh, and uh, our next question is, uh, it's Trevor, Trevor Scoble. Is it Scoble? Scoby, sorry. I've got, I, I think the eye looks cost me like an owl. You've got Scoble as well, yes. Yeah. Good afternoon. Does the, the 2019 PVP event meet the requirements on means of escape in relation to HSE 154 and HSE 192? Okay. 
All right, Mr. Scobie, and I apologise for getting your name wrong. It, um, it is written down here as an hour. Yeah. The Pride Village Party is run by Brighton Pride Community Interest Company. Brighton Pride CIC complies with the pro and provides events management plans and a risk assessment for the Pride Village Party annually, as required under current health and safety legislation. These plans outline the means of escape, movement and management of people in normal operating procedures and in any emergency. These are subject to scrutiny and approval for a multi-agency process. This is the City Safety Advisory Group. The fire service are part of the consultation process and no objections have been raised to the current plans. The event on the day is also overseen by a multiple agency Silver Command based at Sussex Police HQ, who monitor crowds and will make decisions to ensure the safety of attendees and other interested parties is maintained. And I have a footnote here that says, there is no HSE 192 currently in publication. Um, do, do you have a supplementary? Yes. yes. Could you, sorry, this is please. As the council officers did not attend the 2018 PVP, no follow-up and no follow-up public meeting was convened to gather information. And as the consultation document went public on the day before, the council, that group, local that group, and the Kingscliff Society agreed street by street walkabout to present the residents' issues. Does this consultation document therefore deal with the residents' problems? Notwithstanding that, the, the report itself, uh, mathematically, it's given a majority for a move of the PVP. Right. Do you want to come in here? Is that the right follow? Yeah. 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 I think we're all looking a bit lost. The issue you're raising will be uh, debated later on when we do the um, PV, PVP. Um, report. So if we could wait till then, I'm sure you'll get the answers you require. And it will be open to everybody then. Thank, thanks very much, and thanks for bringing the question. The deputations coming, uh, and the first one is swift boxes. Um, so, uh, I don't know if you'd like to come forward. I'm just trying to, to see. It, it's Chloe Rose come. Oh, you're there. <laughs> Hello, thank you for uh, letting me speak today. My name is Chloe Rose. I work for the RSPB and I'm a conservation officer in the South East Regional Office. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about SWIFTS. Um, in just a few months' time, SWIFTS will be making their amazing 6,000-mile journey from Africa. Um, they're only here for a short time, so do keep your eyes open between May and August. Um, and that's when you'll see them soaring through the skies, catching insects, um, looking out for nesting sites if they're not already nesting in our homes. Um, they have a very distinctive call. Um, a lot of people associate with summer, and as I'm sure everyone in the room is particularly looking forward to the warm weather and all of those summer sounds that come with it. And it does beg the question that what would it be like in the spring and summer if it got progressively quieter? The scientific name Apis Apis means no foot, no foot, and they actually have very weak feet, um, but they make up for that with their flight. They're superb flyers. Um, spending their entire life, apart from in the nesting, on the wing, eating, mating, um, sleeping. So the threat, com the threat to the species comes around, um, and also just to notify as well that the BTO surveys have actually um, revealed a decline of 53% in the past 21 years um, in the UK, and that's between 1995 and 2016. They once used to nest in trees, um, now they rely entirely on buildings to, to nest. Modern properties are now constructed in ways, that, in ways that exclude potential future opportunities for birds like swifts. 
um, and they're also at risk because because they're so unobtrusive. People don't realise they're there. People do conversions, maintenance, and it ends up blocking the the, the holes. Swifts are site faithful, um, and that means that they will come back to the exact same spot year after year with their life partner. And if the holes have been blocked up, they have been known to kill themselves trying to get back into them. Um, so there's simply not enough nesting opportunities in new developments across Brighton Hove and without a clear policy that compensates the loss of the nest and provides new opportunities and developments, there's no guarantee that Swifts will thrive in Brighton Hove in the future. Um, the RSV have, making, have been making a headway on undertaking where Swifts are nesting in Brighton um, and the key hotspots that we've got um, by a load of volunteers basically going out uh, year after year looking at um, where they're nesting and we've got 105 nest, nest sites in total. And these are all thanks to just little nooks and crannies in, in people's buildings and, and how, homes. Um, now, the, the, the good thing is that, that nests are easily incorporated into the fabric of new developments. Um, and being relatively low in cost and with various designs that are available, such as the one that we've got on our table. Um, and they offer easy, easy ways to be able to enhance uh, for biodiversity gain. City Plan 2 is the opportunity to include a clear and, in this case, species-specific policy. Um, it's also extremely timely when the current Brighton General Hospital site, which holds the largest and believed to be the oldest colony in Brighton & Hove, is now endangered, and that is due to the redevelopment there. So we'll be looking to the council to support us on this. Um, Brighton & Hove, as we all know, are a leading city for conservation, and we have national reputation for being environmentally friendly. And here is yet another way that we can lead, lead, the, the, lead the way. Our vision is by working with the council, the RSPB hopes that swift bricks like this will be in, installed in every suitable new development in accordance with strength and policy, which ensures developers are adhering to new legislation and to ensure that we don't lose this very special bird from our city. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, thanks very much, and thanks very much for doing it well in time as well. Not only informative, but um, brief as well. Uh, Councillor Nemeth is now going to present a notice of motion, and let's hope he can be uh, as informative and brief. <laughs> Uh, thank, you, thank you, Chair. Mine's about the birds and the bees. <laughs> um, so th this notice of motion is very much intended to build on the work of the RSPB and Councillor Wheels in campaigning for swift boxes, and it also takes forward my own work in liaising with both planning department um, and a Cornwall-based company called Green and Blue, which is a firm that designs and makes various wildlife-encouraging products. And this company was founded by uh, the brother and the sister-in-law of a Wishward resident. So as far as uh, swift boxes go, I'm not sure I could add a huge amount that hasn't already been said by the experts, um, Chloe and Carolina. I again draw attention to a swift uh, brick, um, which is a form of swift box, and of course this notice of motion just as easily covers the standard boxes that are seen um, on the fronts of buildings, which may be made, made out of wood or other materials. Uh, the sad thing, of course, is that there just aren't enough of them around, and although we have a host of ecological policies in the planning guidance, such features uh, just aren't being added as a matter of course, and I think they should be compulsory unless there's a really good reason why they shouldn't be on there, especially when uh, so many gardens and allotments, other spaces, are under threat of development. Um, I also draw your attention to this delightful um, RSPB pin badge, which is in front of each committee member. And this is a gift from Councillor Andrew Wheels personally. Oh. <laughs> and uh, they'll need to be put in the Register of Members' Interests, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, this, is a, this in front of me. Is a, bee, is a bee brick, and this is by the firm called Green and Blue, but it could have been made by, it doesn't have to be from that single company, it costs £28 and it replaces a standard clay bricks. It's, that, it's the right size um, to do that. 
Um, others are available at different prices, different sizes, and at higher prices. Uh, um, I deliberately haven't declared any sort of interest as a beekeeper, which is, of course, my passion, because this is for non-swarming solitary bees, so wild, wild bees, and uh, nothing to do with the activity of making honey. Um, it would encourage bees that nest alone, uh, such as red mason bees um, and leafcutter bees, so each hole is for an individual home. Uh, swift boxes and bee bricks can be retrofitted, uh, but the hope is that they would become, um, uh, become the norm on every new scheme uh, to the point where serious questions would be asked if such devices are not present. So the notice of motion is deliberately open to allow future discussion about what is meant by a new development, whether or not both or just one would be incorporated, what opt-out clauses might be, and what happens when a development incorporates multiple independent units, all to be discussed. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I'll ask Councillor Norman to second the motion. Uh, the, the motion. Second, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I, 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 is there any committee members who'd like to make comment at all? I'm more than happy. Uh, Mary, uh, Councillor Mears. Thank you, Chair. And, and thank you for the presentation, which I found really, really interesting, and, and the birds and the bees. Uh, I just wanted to talk from my, from my housing hat, actually, because I, I find that really, really interesting. And, and through the Council's um, regen, housing regeneration, we have got schemes coming through uh, before City Plan Part 2. And I think it's a, a real opportunity for us as councillors. We've got a, a regeneration meeting on Monday. And it would be a really good opportunity to broaden that into our housing stock, because it runs right around the city, in a way that we could look at that as our developments are already coming through the pipeline. So I'm very keen, um, and I've seen officers nodding, so that's the yes, because I can see the officers relevant that, that have nodded. But I just think it, we, we've got an opportunity to start now, sooner, because there are properties development in pipeline, and rather than just wait for City Plan Part 2, and that's from the Council's Housing Court, Regeneration Building Portfolio. So thank you very much, and I thought it was really worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Uh, uh, um, Phelan, Councillor McCafferty. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, this is all really good stuff. Um, completely agree, that's fine. Um, I, the only thing I would say is um, where this discussion is happening, when it's happening. Um, we obviously know about um, the mass extinction of species. Um, we've lost 60% of all the animal populations since 1970. Um, so I suppose my point would really be we can cover every house. Um, we can cover every new house all over the city with bee bricks, with swift bricks, whatever else. But the reality is that however hard or however tough our local policy is, we need national legislation to protect the environment and we need national moves from government to stop corrosive environmental policies like the pursuit of fossil fuels and fracking and the destruction of the environment that is so needed for SWIFTs to live in. Yes, of course, it's great that we'll do whatever we can locally on this and we will be supporting this motion, but we need much stronger moves from national government as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, Julie. Thank you, Chair. Um, as Chair of Planning for at least the next eight weeks, um, I'm really, you know, wholly sort of behind all of the measures that you said. And indeed, um, it ha is something that we have um, encouraged in the past, but um, I think what, what you're saying is it may, may not have been sort of pushed hard enough. And certainly, um, well, you've got three members of the Planning Committee sitting here. We've got two more planning committees coming. We know that we've got quite a lot of uh, big residential schemes coming through, so I'm sure that you know, we'll be fighting to put our hands up um, to sort of say and, and, and to sort of uh, talk about this as being, these measures as being included um, every way we can. The other thing is I was wondering if we could maybe do 
do a kind of a council promotion. Um, you know, like that we have these promotions every now and again on, um, on, the, on the, face, the Facebook. I'm looking at Julie over there as a community comms officer, um, where we can sort of say to people, did you know you can get these? Um, and, and, and sort of just do a, you know, a thing about it. So we as a council promote, um, promote all this. Is that something we could do? Um, do, sure. do we, can we just, um, do we need, we don't need to take a photo or anything, do we? No, no. 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 Okay, well, we've got Liz here and, and Nick. The other thing I'd like to ask, um, did you make representations on the local plan, part two, city plan part two? You did? Yeah. Okay, because that, obviously, that's, um, that will be coming to us, well, come to this committee <laughs> in the next cycle at, um, at some stage, but I'm, glad, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you did, which is great. Thank you very much. So, yeah, wholly supportive from me and um, I'm no doubt the rest of us on this side. Thank Absolutely. you. Thanks very much, Julie. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very supportive of this and welcome you bringing this to, to the committee. Um, I was just, uh, just wondering whether, in the meantime, because obviously this plan part two is a bit, a bit of a wear away, whether we could use a standard informative on all planning applications or planning permissions that we would, is there not a condition, but it's an informative that we could ask developers to con at least consider putting this in? We do, we do ask for, uh, we do attach conditions on major schemes asking for, for this kind of um, nature conservation improvement measures, biodiversity measures. Um, it's something we'll look at for, for the next planning committee. Okay, is everybody. Can I just ask a couple of quick questions? Firstly, I, I note that you say there's, there's properties that these wouldn't be suitable on. P presumably, that would be perhaps where cats or foxes or something could get at them. Uh, and I just worry slightly that um, that's got to come across to people, you know, particularly those fitting these retrospectively who may feel that they're doing a really good thing but would be putting them where the, where, you know, where the, 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 the swift is, is in danger. That might not be the case, but you, if you, you, you can let me know. And secondly, it, presumably, does this, uh, are these okay for swallows as well, or is it in some way specifically for a swift? So the, you, you raise a very good point, and there is a, you have to be very specific with where you actually put these um, bricks. Um, so, for example, because, as I talked about, they haven't got feet, as we know them, <laughs> with what normal birds would be able to perch and take off. So they have to, they have to in order to fly, they, they drop and glide. So they need a, a, a clear runway um, in order to be able to take off successfully and, and to fly. Um, so hence why we sort of said about having, having them in places that were um, uh, appropriate. Um, and things like a, you know, a bungalow wouldn't be, wouldn't be ideal because you need a certain sort of, you know, five metre um, distance to be able to do that. Um, so it, it, we'd have to obviously specify those, those details to ensure that they weren't just being put in, being put in willy-nilly. In terms of people actually putting up boxes and, and doing their own thing, um, we do, there's lots of information on, on the website and things like that that we've got to, to, to direct people. Um, so. There's, there's, you know, there's that sort of thing that's covered. And um, what, what was your other question? Sorry. Uh, uh, oh, oh swallows. That's <laughs> yeah. Are they, uh, are they <coughs> different species? Well, they're obviously a different species, but yeah. They... There are, so the reason why we hang on about swift so much is because they are completely reliant on buildings. Um, other birds like you know, house sparrows or, or swallows and <coughs> starlings, they can nest elsewhere um, and they, they're not site specific and they're, they're sort of more of a general um, type of nester. Um, swifts are extremely fussy, very intelligent birds but as I say they, ha they are very site faithful and they, they need to have these sort of um, protected because they can't just come back the next year and just think I'll build another nest. It doesn't tend to happen. <coughs> Yes. <coughs> so the actual the size of the hole is designed specifically so that larger birds can't get in there. You probably will get smaller things like wrens and things, but um, they're sort of more, more competition you're, you're going to exclude. Um, it's a little bit controversial. You know, you are kind of looking after one specific species, but as I say, I think we always come back to the point of 
we don't have as many trees and forests as we once did and that's why they have adapted to, to our buildings instead um, and hence why we need to kind of it's our responsibility really to, to look after them um, in terms of where they're nesting yeah. yeah so all the new builds that are coming forward like these sort of large developments um, and large um, new build flats etc are perfect because they're tall buildings um, so there's lots of opportunities but it's just getting them in, in as a condition and, and making sure that that's, that's actually followed through Okay. Sorry. Sorry, Mary. Sorry, just for you, Chair, that was really interesting, particularly your last point about tall buildings. So really, I suppose I'm looking at this option or Nick for planning, because a lot of, Julie may be able to come in on this as well, because a lot of the, a lot of the uh, planning applications that are coming through is they're built in such a way that uh, not necessarily, obviously on their council we have cladding. But uh, there's, there's issues on some of the newer designs as well. So I'm assuming, because plan is not my thing, is that there will be some technical ones that they wouldn't be able to, to go on, but there perhaps will be others that would be more suitable. I'm just interested in the height that it would need. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. No, I think you're right, Mary, and I think... Um, the, the, no, it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I think we've covered all the... Yeah, I think we've covered all I think you start I think to, I know what, what Mary means. It's yeah. about the different sort of, uh, you know, new building techniques, some of the sort of cladding and so on that's put on. Yeah. But there will be opportunities where, um, particularly in landscaping schemes, and there will be opportunities where things can be fitted in. It's not outside of the remit of these things, so I'm sure, um, especially when we have the pre-app discussions. Um, we can, okay. You know, we can well, 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 thanks, thanks very much, and uh, thanks for the information you've presented today. Um, there's a policy framework in the city plan and in guidance that support implementation of natural conservation measures and new developments. And as somebody who's called Robbins and whose mother was called Peacock, I am happy to agree the quest that officers prepare a report to, um, to address the notions of motion and deputation. So thanks very much. Uh, does the committee agree to receive a report on this matter? Okay. Thanks very much. Um, and so the next, uh, uh, the next uh, uh, deputation um, is from uh, Adrian Hart. Uh, is, is Mr. Hart here? You can come forward. Thank you very much. Sorry, yes, we're ready whenever you are. You've got five minutes, which is ticking down there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, the somewhat in vogue catastrophizing phrase going over a cliff edge surely applies to the direction this council takes us all with its Pride Piper housing policy. Dominated by, obligated to, in essence, under the cosh of a deliver the numbers or else Whitehall command, it feels like to our neighbourhood certainly the city's housing policy will continue to deliver minuscule amounts of homes that citizens in need can afford, while inflicting adverse impacts, impacts on the day-to-day -day human life of the city, adverse effects that will become all too obvious in years to come. The net adverse impact of bloated, ill-conceived city plan crunching housing juggernauts landing in the city one by one and which fail miserably to tackle genuine housing need will demonstrably and significantly not outweigh their benefits, perhaps not even in terms of economic growth. You must surely agree that the evidence of this has already loomed into view. Our citizen group recognises and sympathises with the Council's enforced Pied Piper role, but from the standpoint of local democracy, it urges this committee to reflect and respond to the following. We apologise, of course, if this is something reflected upon and di discussed ad infinitum at Council. 
Uh, the five-year housing land supply issue relating to National Planning Policy Framework, paragraph 11, footnote 7, as relayed by the latest SHLAA update, means that purveyors of bad planning proposals for large-scale housing developments have never had it so good. Naturally, the Council feels it must defend the planning process insofar as it answers some housing need. Indeed, we applaud those within the Council who encourage every creative opportunity it sees, be it self-build housing co-ops and the efforts of community land trusts, build to rent initiatives and so on. But can the Council really say that large-scale luxury apartment proposals, even if 40% were homes ordinary citizens could afford, are, under present circumstances, approved without compromising scrutiny. We ask Brighton and Hove City Council this. If large-scale planning will be ushered through the planning process with only token scrutiny and with attempts to oppose or amend from citizen, ward councillor, local society and other organisations met with nebulous procedural explanations of factors that somehow outweigh harm, then why insult citizens with a planning process at all? Lastly, we'd like to urge that if you do think there is a case to answer contained in any of what I've said, your response avoids any of those pitfalls of Orwellian newspeak, if not straightforward town hall fudge. If that sounds ill-tempered or unfair, then we'd be pleased if you would reflect on the context of our campaign group's diligent and exhaustive efforts to ask planners, including committee members, not to reject so much as simply spend a minute talking to us, looking at our drawings, considering before statutory time limits run out, thus risk risking developer-led court action, that 21st century neighbourhoods are not all NIMBYs and will increasingly and proactively point out the extraordinary missed opportunities for the built environment alone. Big, builds, uh, big, big house builder proposals frequently entail. In other words, we were ignored and the opportunity, opportunity to return the Amex site proposals in our neighbourhood back to the drawing board was lost. If something can be gained uh, for us today, it will be a response from this committee, committee that ends the delusion that the government defined housing crisis it purports to be steadfastly addressing has anything to do with the crisis affecting middle, low income, increasingly homeless, long term citizens of this city who are in a state of real crisis. Stop colluding with the disingenuous use of the phrase affordable housing and be honest with us about the illusion of planning scrutiny and the absurd theatre of planning hearings for proposals already decided. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you for almost coming in on time as well, just uh, about 10 seconds over. Um, well, as somebody who's not really noted for their Orwellian newspeak, I'll do my best. Thank you for your deputation and I understand your concerns. The local planning authority has a quasi-judicial role in putting development plans into place and determining planning applications. It is required to operate within a framework of rules set by national policy. Policies in the city plan go as far as they can to address local issues, such as housing need within those rules. For example, by setting a target of 40% affordable housing on major new developments and securing affordable housing on smaller schemes, the government policy requires all local planning authorities to set out their five-year housing land uh, supply position in an annual basis. The government has also recently introduced a housing delivery test. There are penalties where local authorities cannot demonstrate they are not delivering enough housing against the adopted plans. The Council's planning service has to work within this framework. But the lack of a five-year housing supply is not in itself sufficient reason to permit a scheme where there are others sufficient concerns. 
you can be assured that planning applications are scrutinised by planning officers and technical ex experts, and that all major applications are carefully considered by the planning committee. It is important that local residents are engaged at the earliest possible stages on major development proposals before a planning application is submitted. This is encouraged by government guidance and on, sta on statement of community involvement. I am afraid that it isn't, however, a requirement. I am advised that the engagement is undertaken in the case of the former Amex start site as part of the planning brief for the site and by the applicants. I am sorry to hear that you don't feel you were listened to. I understand your concerns, but whether affordable housing generally meets local needs, to address this the Council actively involves, is actively involved in several initiatives to deliver genuine affordable homes for local people and has already successfully delivered over 170 homes for affordable rent over the last three years through the new Homes and Neighbourhoods programmes, with many, hundred more, many hundreds more in the pipeline. Does the committee agree the deputation? They agree. Okay. Thank you very much for coming today, Mr. Hart. Um, now we have petitions uh, referred from full council. Um, and the first one is uh, Brighton and Hove events plastic free. Uh, Carol Mortimer, would you like to come forward to hear the result, uh, the response? Is Carol here at all? No. Do, would you like me to still give the response, or no? Everybody's okay with it, are they? Jolly good. Right. So we can move on. Uh, does the committee agree? Yes. Does the, the, the committee agree to note the petition? Okay. So we're moving on to the next uh, petition that comes to us from full council. Um, and this is a uh, Zippo Circus. Uh, so, is Victoria Wood here at all? No? Would anybody like to come forward to listen to the response? Well, I, I will give the response here because it is very, very brief. Thank, thanks, thank, thanks for your petition and congratulations on the number of signatures obtained. I note that Zippo has decided against using animals in the circus tour this year. Um, so first we'll, we'll, um, we'll receive the report here. Does the committee agree to note the petition? And then with regard to that petition, we have um, a notice of motion. Which Council, uh, Councillor Platt, would you like to present the notice of motion, please? Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, so this latest motion comes um, from the Labour and Cooperative Group for, about animals in circuses. Um, and the main reason for putting this forward is that we were concerned following the presentation of the petition at full council about the perception of um, our position. Um, the Labour Group supported the petition but opposed the Green Amendment based on the legal advice we'd received regarding case law relating to Somerset County Council and the risk of the costs that we might incur as a council if we did not give due regard to that legal advice. Um, however, the Chair of TDC and I remained unhappy about the situation um, in particular, both of us are opposed both to dog and horse racing. Um, and we've also checked the RSPCA website, um, which states that in England, wild animals must be licensed, but there is no law to stop circuses using certain types of animals. Um, so we are, we were in a quandary, but we wanted to recognize the many concerns that have been raised with us um, by residents about this issue. We were sympathetic to the spirit of the petition. Um, so in order to address that, we've put forward this motion um, and I would like to um, welcome the Green Party's amendment which adds to the motion and which the Labour Group will be accepting. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and I, I, I formally second um, that motion. Uh, so now we can invite committees, uh, a, a comments from the committee members, and then we'll move on to uh, the Green Amendment on it. So, uh, so first we'll talk of um, the, the, the motion, the, the Labour motion. So, Tom, do you want to speak on that? 
Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll speak on the whole thing, if that's right. Yeah, please do. Yeah. And shall I move the amendment at the same time? I mean, it's yeah. been accepted, yeah, which is very well. Yeah, yeah, please yeah, do. makes sense. Um, yeah, I'll be very brief. Um, just, just to say, uh, obviously, it's very welcome, the, um, the position taken by the Labour group and the, uh, the norm that uh, is here in front of us today. Um, the, the norm mainly focuses on what we can do nationally, and that's very, very important, and we wholeheartedly support efforts to move policy nationally. Um, however, we should also obviously recognise what we can do locally, and I do appreciate it's, you know, it's legally difficult. We are, you know, we, we can't always do what we might want to do. But uh, we have come up with a form of words that uh, is legally uh, agreeable, uh, which is that the Council seeks to update the Outdoor Events Charter to clarify that event organisers must comply with the Council's Animal Welfare Charter, so th and so that it is clear that the Council's hope and expectation is that event organisers will avoid the use of performing animals at events on Council-owned land. Um, thank you. Thanks so much. Would anybody else like to add anything? Oh, sorry, Taylor, I'll go ask you to second it, of course. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to second the amendment, and I suppose um, what I want to try and flag up um, is that while we await um, a future ruling that might be more helpful perhaps for local authorities like ourselves in terms of actually banning domesticated animals and circuses, that this is, if you like, wanting to clarify the desire and will of our council as landowner to discourage the worst practices. And I suppose my hope, my anticipation by us all agreeing at the amendments in front of us today that would be that the best practice would in effect undermine the worst and that we would seek to carve out um, we would seek to carve out um, the aspiration of where we would want the law to be in future by by uh, by forcing ahead on the issue locally as it stands. Obviously we still have an awful lot of work to do at the national level and I'm glad to see that one of the key commitments from the Labour motion is that we ask the city's three MPs to try and uh, kick off at the national level because I think that's where we need uh, the clarity most and in the meanwhile what our amendment is seeking to do uh, is to is to try and forge ahead and try and encourage the best practice. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, and thanks, uh, as Nancy said, we're, we're, uh, thanks for the uh, additional um, amendment. I, I think, Joe, that you want to say something. Yeah, uh, yeah just um, on the uh, notice of motion and the uh, amendment, um, I think our, our group have got a free vote on, on, on the matter because it's a matter of conscience. Uh, I, I went to Zippo Circus as a child and quite enjoyed it, but now in hindsight you think actually maybe that's, as an adult, you look back and think maybe it's not the most appropriate thing. Um, and I'll be supporting, supporting the uh, note of motion and the um, amendment. I do think it's a little bit pointless. However, us wasting the Chief Executive's time in writing to the Secretary of State, I'm sure you just get a general civil servant reply. I suspect the Secretary of State never sees it. And likewise, I don't know why you don't ask Caroline, exactly. you don't ask Lloyd, and you don't ask exactly. Peter. It's our flagship policy. We already have it. I, so why are we writing them to ask? If it's well, already a well, no, you didn't, but the, the Labour Party. I, just don't, I think it's just a waste of our Chief Executive's time, but I'm happy to support it if you wish to do that. Right, so you're happy to support us based on the Chief Executive's time. So and and I, I would point out as well that it was actually part of the Conservative government's manifesto in 2010. And had it not been talked out by their own people, it would probably now be law. Um, so maybe we should just ask him to revisit his own manifesto of 2010. But anyway, we're, shall, we, shall we just say then, um, Sorry. propose to agree the action set out in the notice of motion as amended. Oh, sorry, I've got to put the green, I feel like one of them swifts winging it today. Put the green group's motion, of, uh, uh, motion to the vote. Uh, all those in favour of the green amendment? Yeah, no, to amend it. 
Yeah. yeah. We need to vote. We still need to vote. You know, we, we've accepted it, but we, we need to vote. So, all, all those in favour of the Green Amendment? I think that's unanimous, and of course, myself. So. Well, there isn't any other. We're now, we're now just pro we propose the, to agree in the actions as set out in the notice of motion as amended. Does the committee agree? Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I asked at the right time. I, I said, can we, and building on what Joe just said, can we take the three things separately, please? I think I think this is slightly different to recommendations in the report. This this is one notice of motion. Um, so you'll be voting on the notice of motion as it's just been amended. Um, you may want to take a, a vote so that you can see who's for and who's against. I mean if I yeah but yeah. Well, so uh, we're now going to take a vote then on the substantive as, as um, yeah. Well, I, I don't mind. So if, if we could if we could vote on the notice of motion as amended, all those in favour, all those against, and abstentions. Okay. Jolly good. So I think we've. Uh, now we're going to move on to the report. Um, so before we do, does anybody want to take a break now to, to consider the, um, would now be a time to do it or would you want to move on with the, with, with the report and wait? Okay. Keep going. Question of clarity, because yes, we've just passed that notice of motion and within this green group of men make request that all outdoor events on council and land sign up to the outdoor events charter, is that relevant in within there because the notice of motion has just been agreed? I don't know, I think you've got the wrong notice of motion. What? Yeah. 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 I think now he's asking about this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to, do you want to come in, Alice? Okay. So those amendments are to the outdoor strategy report, which we will come to, but we it, they're not inconsistent with the notice of motion that's just yeah, that's been agreed. Point. They're not inconsistent. They're not inconsistent. If one is disagreed to and the other has agreed to, then which one takes precedent? Do you want to we're moving on to, an, a, a, to discussing an amendment of an agenda item we're not, we've not got to yet, but... but um, the, the, way, the way the amendment for the event strategy is drafted is consistent with the notice of motion. If, if this amendment wasn't agreed, the notice of motion, that, that steer in relation to the discouragement of the use of animals in working with the charter would still stand. But this, the notice of the Green Group amendment in relation to the outdoor event strategy covers a number of things. It's a Green Group amendment that, um, that covers a number of things, including... Um, the issue of discouraging the use of animals in circuses. Does that make sense? Just for clarity for me, because we've had a joint amendment from Labour and Greens around, uh, around the notice of motion, so that stands. So I've absolutely got that. So I don't quite see the relevance of that in the, in the next um, uh, Green Group amendment, because it is a Labour and Green. It's already been agreed yeah, for the Labour exactly. part that has taken it, so I, I don't see the relevance of that being in there because it's automatically been agreed. Does the first notice of motion have precedent, or could the Greens remove that first? Yeah. That's the bullet point, and then it's not. 
Well, shall we wait till we come to it? We'll wait till we come to it on the... Uh, yeah, okay. So, so what I suggest we do is we, we move on with the agenda as it is, and then before the outdoor event strategy, we'll all take five minutes to go away and discuss what's there. Okay. So we'll move on to the uh, review of Pride Village Party, and I think Joe's going to do this for us. Yes, please do. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, this report is a result of a deputation to full council in April 2018 by the King's Cliff Society, requesting that consideration is given to moving the Pride Village Party from its current location in St James's Street to Madeira Drive. Concern was raised by residents due to the disruption caused to local residents due to noise and to the area and the inconvenience with the area being cordoned off. It was agreed that a review would be carried out to look at the feasibility of this. In 2014, the Economic Development and Culture Committee agreed to Brighton Pride Community Interest Company running the event in its current format until 2020. There is a general feeling that the event is safer since the introduction of a ticketed event in 2014-15. As part of the review, a public consultation was undertaken and over 2,800 responses were received, the majority of which did not support moving the event. <coughs> we are recommending that the event is not moved from its current location, that Brighton Pride continue to run the event and that committee delegates authority to the Executive Director Neighbourhoods, Communities and Housing to negotiate and grant landlords' consent when the current consent ends in 2020. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, do we want to do questions and comments or just do comments and questions in one in here? I mean, we can, yeah, okay, we'll do it in one here then. So, uh, uh, who'd, uh, who'd like to go first? And who'd like to, right, Robert, we'll put you down as first. Right, so Robert, if you'd like to go first. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. My, so can I just draw everyone's attention to page 45, which is Appendix 1, and it's, the, uh, it's a list of bullet points that goes on to the next page of things that the uh, Kingscliff Society isn't happy about. Now, my, my own preference would be that the party stays where it is, but that the Kingscliff Society are happy. The list of points are all... A fairly, fairly straightforward request that, that are fairly easy to meet if the event was run um, in the way that most of us would hope events are run. So I was, my question really is, why hasn't this been able to uh, be squared? These, these are all, I mean, I speak from experience of running or part running Lagoon Fest at Hove Lagoon, which had 8,000 people, and these are all things that we would have sorted. You know, we didn't have any complaints of this like at all. Quite a different event, but you know, it's a smaller version. So uh, I'm really just trying to get to the bottom of why, 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 why we are where we are, where we are. And the wristband thing, I absolutely agree with uh, Kingscliff Society. Over. If I lived there, there's no way I'd be forced to wear sort of marker on my body, telling, you know, telling, t having to justify who I was. I don't think that's on at all. There must be a better way. Uh, to square that, and the same goes for stamps on hands. I think that would be very wrong indeed. So that's my sort of question and main point. I hope this can be squared, but why isn't it? Um, we can certainly look at that going forward. Um, we are in uh, constant discussions with Pride as a city council, um, and normally Pride, there, there are sort of quite big debriefs every year after the event, so certainly we can take that forward um, and have those discussions with Pride, and that potentially could be part of any negotiations with future landlords. Come back on that, though. Uh, this, this, um, this, this problem has been ticking along through uh, council. I mean, I've seen several um, questions, uh, I think a deputation, and then discussed in individual meetings. Um, it's not a new set of points that are being raised, and it's clearly been important enough to bring before us today. So, um, what's, what's, the, what's the council's 
um, position here on why, I mean, other events such as um, the, the running events, when, when problems are raised, someone, I mean, usually somebody like um, Ian would um, s s speak to the event organiser and say, What's, um, why aren't you doing this right? So I'm trying to get a feel for why the council hasn't got that answer on why there's these, still these disagreements. Mean, can anybody tell me why, why are these disagreements continuing? Because they're all quite easy things to resolve. Um, I'm afraid I, I can't answer. Ian, I don't know if you're able to. Um, I can't answer that either, but I think what we can do is take it on from here. Um, they seem a set of points, as you say, which are fairly standard and across many events. Um, from this point onwards, I will work with Pride or Sat over there to, to work chronologically through all of those points that have been made. There doesn't seem to be anything insurmountable in them. Okay, um, so Mary. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to say, in the past, you know, as Conservative, we've always been very supportive of the Pride, and there's a gentleman in the audience that's right at the back that knows without the Conservative at a particular time, they would have been in serious trouble. But I, I do have issues around page 45. I suppose really from the Council's perspective and the organisers, because I don't live around that area, and I'm sure many of us in this chamber don't live around that area, but if I did, I'd be very angst with, with some of the complaints that are here before us, because you know, particularly if it's, an, if it's warm weather and there's no rubbish collected and, you know, there's n nobody, sort of, nobody's visible. There's nobody that's accountable. And I'm sure it's, it's easily addressed, but I think the council's got to step up to the mark as well, quite frankly, on this, because, you know, there's nobody in charge of the stewards. When a, a big event is organised, all this goes through a process. And that process needs to be tightened up because clearly the residents in, in the Kingsley Society are really concerned. And not last year, but the year before. Last year was okay. The year before, there was really serious issues with the War Memorial at the Old Steam, where not only was it used as a public toilet, I'm not even going to say what house it was used for, and last year it was fenced round. So we can, the council can take proper action when there are issues. We can address it so that actually pride can go ahead, people come down and they enjoy it. But people that live in the, in the vicinity also have an opportunity to not to actually live their life. It's going to be noisy. There's no way that many people in a congested area is not going to be noisy. But some of the other points that are there, I think from the council's perspective, we, we need to do more, if I'm quite honest. We need to insist around, um, you know, uh, how it works with their stewards. Toilets were, um, were installed even though contractors were where they were not working. What is the point of putting the toilet in if it doesn't work? That's the problem the year before we had at the War Memorial because they used it as a toilet. So it's really basic to ensure that the whole event, the city thoroughly enjoys it, but it's, it's planned much, much better. So all the key things are in place before, so we know there's going to be toilets, and we know they're going to work. We know there's going to be rubbish collected. We know there's going to be stewards that are actually visible. And, um, and I would think from the council's perspective, that tick box should happen so that pride you know fantastic event everybody enjoys it but we also have a, a responsibility to residents that live in the city and we need to ensure that their concerns are, are listened to that we can both sides can have the weekend and apart from earplugs they should actually be able to get on with their lives and quite clearly there's an issue so from my point of view Chair, we need, as a council, to take more control to make sure everything is done as it should be done. So when it happens, there isn't this whole list of complaints from residents. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Chair. That's me. Um, I, I don't know if it's worth pointing out that th this is just feedback. I mean, we're, we're, do we know that the toilets were installed even though the contractors knew they weren't working? 
I mean, that's feedback we've been told, but is that, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's, there's two points there. If the toilets were installed and they weren't working, it's one thing, but if contractors installed them knowing that they weren't working, that makes it slightly worse. But it, it is only feedback, it's, you know, to... Yes, please do. Um, I, under, I understand that sort of like there was an issue one particular year with one particular toilet and that was addressed. Um, I, I understand as well from the um, review that we carried out um, that additional stewards have been put in place and they're now highly visible. So certainly this year, um, or sorry, 2018, I can get my years wrong, uh, 2018, um, there were a lot more stewards, they were a lot more visible, the people knew who they were. Um, and the rubbish um, collections are trying to be done as quickly as possible so that the residents can get back to normal. Thanks very much. Nancy. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, well, I'd like to speak in favour of the um, Five Village Party remaining in St. Jacob Street because I feel that street is very much at the heart of the gay community um, and it's where many businesses and venues are owned and used by the gay community. So I see it very much as their area. Um, and if we move the venue for the Pride Village Party to Madeira Terrace, um, it probably wouldn't be local traders that benefited from Pride Village Party because we'd probably end up bringing in traders from outside to serve food and drink and they would take the profit out of the city and our local economy would be worse off and that's contrary to our community wealth building approach. Um, so I'd like to make the case for it staying both on economic and equality grounds where it is now. Um, I actually don't recognise some of what is in the report from the Kingscliff Society. Um, I'm not a member, but I am a local resident, so I do live in the area. It's my local shopping street. I'm two streets away, um, and I do go down to that street during Pride Weekend. And I have to say that the experience in 2017 was very different from 2016. I felt that a lot of the issues were addressed that people raised. Um, issues, particularly for those of us that live a couple of streets away, um, it was addressed that um, we needed to have communication across a wider area. Uh, we were offered the opportunity to get wristbands and we did know that we needed them. Um, and it was much easier to access and we went down there on Sunday morning. Um, the security guards were still there but it was quite easy to access. Um, they still did check bags, so I don't recognise that because my partner's bag was actually checked. Um, we were able to get in and out of the shops. It was absolutely cleaned up from the previous night before the Sunday night party started. So I deliberately went down there and had a look this year and actually that list, I'm not sure if that list is from the current year, whether it's one person's comments, how many people's comments it relates to, but it's very different from the experience certainly that I had and I feel that actually um, a lot of the issues that were addressed in previous years were addressed. Um, I think that having attended the meetings with the Pride organisers, I found that their approach is very well organised and very well managed and that people were listened to. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Tom. Thank you, Chair. A lot of people have made a lot of good points already, um, but I've got a few, a few points and a few questions. Um, I think, uh, broadly speaking, I, I think the, the case is clear. Uh, there's not a case to move the party. Um, there is absolutely a case to continue the party. Um, it would be a great shame if the party uh, disappeared from the area. Kemptown is at the heart of Brighton's gay scene, and it's right and proper that Kemptown plays a central role in celebrating our city's diversity. Um, there were, however, a number of very important points raised in the consultation, and I was particularly moved by the report from a young mother uh, about the difficulties getting her baby through the streets and not being able to access the street that she lives on and being told to kind of go around the block and I thought that was very strange and, and very unnecessary. Um, so my question is, well, a few questions. Um, do you know why that happened and is that likely to happen again? Can we uh, guarantee residents that they can access their own street as long as it's you know, not completely blocked off. But I think it's unreasonable to ask people to walk around the block and access their street from three streets away. Um, police forces being used from out of area. I know, obviously, we need help from the police when 
when there are big events on and lots for Pride Weekend especially, we get police from all over the south of England and, and in Wales. I've seen police from Wales come for Pride. Um, but it, it does make sense that for very local policing that we have for the, yeah, for the Kemp Town Village Party, um, it, you know, we do need police officers who do know Brighton a little bit and, uh, and, and know what Pride's all about. Um, can the wristband issue be addressed? Because uh, it's, it's clear from a number of the responses that people resent wearing wrist, wristbands to access their own houses, um, and surely a driver's licence or utility bill would serve the same function. Um, and then comments about rubbish cleanup. I mean, it was really good to hear Council Platts just now um, talking about the improvements in rubbish cleanup. But um, it really is, you know, it's, it's one thing if residents are asked to share their neighbourhood with the whole city uh, for the weekend. But the least we can do as a city is make sure we clean it up really quickly afterwards for them. Thank you. So um, in terms of the young woman who wasn't able to access her house, I'm afraid I, I can't answer that, but there are people here from um, Pride who organise it and they may be able to answer that question for you, councillor. Um, in terms of the um, police um, question that you raised about making sure that we have local officers available, um, that's certainly something that we can discuss with, with Sussex Police going forward to ensure that we can put that in place this year. And as Ian mentioned, um, certainly we can have ongoing conversations with Pride C CIC so that we can uh, look at the issue around uh, wristbands. Okay. And yes, we'll have those ongoing conversations I've mentioned previously to make sure that that's sorted out. Okay, Joe, you're next. Yeah, no, I welcome the um, results of the consultation and the Pride Village Party staying uh, in St James's Street. I, I agree with the comments made so far. I think actually what would have happened if you moved it to Madeira Drive is that you end up with two parties and one of which, potentially, and we've heard already, one of which becomes uncontrollable and you end up having to put a lot of emergency procedures in place and we've heard from the police and ambulance service about the implications of that. So I think that would be nonsensical and it, it appears to be a lot more well-managed where it currently is than it used to be uh, and when it wasn't ticketed and, and things like that. So, so I really welcome the steps that have been taken so far, but I do think further steps that have been highlighted already do need to be taken. I think generally I don't think there's enough toilets in the city for Pride. Um, and generally there's not enough bins and that's why there's so much rubbish on the streets. You go out, you can't find a bin anywhere. And you go out and you can't find a toilet anywhere. So what people do, they drop their litter and they go to the toilet somewhere. Um, people need to go, they need to go. Um, so, you know, and you get that en masse and it does upset residents. And I think the City Council does have, a, you know, an obligation to make sure there are enough toilets and there are enough bins for people and there are enough water taps as well, which there weren't last year. Um, so I hope that happens. Um, so apart from being very supportive of it, staying where it is and, and those, those sort of future things that I think you can have. I just one question, I, I, I have raised this before. The recommendation 2.3 delegates authority to the executive director uh, when the current consent ends in 22, but it doesn't really say how long that's going to be for. And I just want, I, I've already seen thought assurance from you, Joe, but I wanted it sort of on record that it, it's not going to be in perpetuity and that if, if issues were raised and concerns are raised in future, uh, that band landlord consent isn't sort of indefinite, isn't 25 years, you know, it can come back to this committee in order to sort of, you know, if, if there is ever a need to change it for another reason, which may be the case in future, we're not sort of bound by, by that. Um, yes, um, having had conversations with the executive director, I mean, it, we wouldn't be looking, as we wouldn't do with, with any event, to grant landlords consent in perpetuity. Um, so it would be um, a limited time frame, and that would be part of the negotiations that the executive director would have uh, with, with the organisers of the event. Thanks very much. Um, so, Mo. Okay, well, going to be a bit of a history lesson here, I'm afraid, because I live in the area, I've lived in the area 
forever. Um, so I know where off I speak. Yeah, well, you know, since I was at it. Okay. okay. Those of us who've been around a very, very long time will remember why this has come to be. And it had come to be because Pride itself has been a, a marvellously growing experience of inclusivity. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of top of the league now in terms of the entertainment and all the rest of it. And let us not forget the income generation, this income that it brings into the city. But, you know, the gay religion of St. James Street used to be where everybody hanged up, hung up, hung up, hung up afterwards. And as Joe has rightly said, you know, it, it wasn't at that point, there was no sort of anything management of it. And, and the decision was taken, um, uh, I can't remember, Joe will remember how many years ago it was, the other Joe, do, 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 do. Um, and um, to set to actually actually manage the situation in St. James Street, and since then it has been vastly, vastly better. But nothing is perfect, guys. We're not going to actually get everything perfect. So, I mean, the points that Mary's made and others have made about keeping on top of things like the rubbish and, you know, maybe wristbands are not the best thing. I mean, they try different things and different ways of making sure residents can keep access and everything. And I think the point about the police is well made. Now, in my role as Lead uh, Council of Community Safety, I sat on the community... Uh, I visited, I don't sit on it, but I, I'm allowed to come along and listen to the Community Safety Partnership um, sort of uh, wash up, if that's the word, after Pride. And um, this is an incredible example of partnership working. I think I did see a police officer, I'm not sure if he's still there. My sight's really bad today. So um, it's a really, really good example. Larissa Reed, who is currently the Executive Director of Neighbours and Things, acts as Gold Command. Um, for Pride. So there's a lot of huge work. This year, for example, I mean, I saw, uh, I walked back from Preston Park to uh, St. James Street and, yeah, and uh, came across various people like licensing colleagues who were checking out something or rather, never mind what. You know, plenty of people, not everybody is always high visited and badged, and there's a good reason for that, but they're there, and particularly in terms of police presence and what's, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and so obviously you'll, you'll gather I'm speaking very much in favour of continuing the street party in St. James Street, and if we were to move it anywhere else, you'd still have it in St. James Street, but it would be running a mock, which would not be a good thing. I want to make a rather, um, something that I'm quite uncomfortable about. Like other colleagues here, I don't recognise some of this bullet point feedback down here. What I do remember was there was not a very comfortable public meeting, um, which I didn't happen to go to, but friends of mine who were residents went. I think um, the executive director was there. I believe there was a senior police officer there, so don't want to go into detail too much. But it really wasn't a very comfortable atmosphere. And I think if I had been there, ooh, um, I would have been quite uncomfortable about a lot of comments that were made on an equalities front. If we can just say it broadly there. I don't know, Nancy's, perhaps, oh, there are nods around there. So I suppose for me, and I accept that the feedback here might certainly be individuals maybe feeding back in that way, and we accept that, you know, nothing is perfect. My memory of the Community Safety Partnership um, wash-up meeting, whatever you call it, Joe, please correct me if I'm wrong about that, was a lot of very serious attention to people coming back with things they thought worked well, things that had not worked quite so well, things that worked better in 2018 than 17. But you know, as I said, nothing is perfect. And I know planning is already going ahead because what happens is Pride is planned out really, really early to address the, um, the things that didn't go so well. And the last thing I think I want to say is, in a sense, I don't know how to say this, we're kind of it's not exactly a victim of your own success, but it is a huge and wonderful event now. We will remember there were other issues. I can't remember if it was last year or the year before about access from the park and, and egress and, and closing the... St I mean, there's all, there are always issues. And we do as a city, and those of you who are going forward on council, uh, and we'll take this forward officially, when I will only be a humble resident, I'm trying to either get in or out of somewhere to get near where I live, um, to think about, obviously, the best way that we can still make pride fantastic the best well i think it's best in the country i mean i know i know other uh, areas challenges but the very very best and the very very best market celebratory weekend for our inclusive welcoming city um and and you know we i know we're all on the case to make that as good as possible so 
Thank you. A pleasure. Thank you, Mo. I don't know if any of us will ever think of you as just a humble anything. So. <laughs> okay, so Anne. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to say much the same as everyone else has already, um, which is probably a good thing. I think it's worth pointing out that the organisers do a really good job at uh, arranging Pride. I think it's something that the majority of those taking part um, enjoy. Um, those of us who go down to Preston Park and have a look at some of the um, entertainment there um, enjoy themselves. I think, I think the majority of people taking part are well behaved and really just want to enjoy the weekend, but there are always just a few who want to do something else. I think I'm, I'm looking at this page 45 and 46, um, and I'm taking it, as I'm reading it, I think it probably is um, a recent document, although I think Councillor Platts had slightly different ideas on some of the viewpoints. I think I'm on page 45 now and it's towards the bottom, the first bullet point, no street cleaning until days after the event and only St James Street was cleaned, the side roads were ignored, no rubbish collectors during the event. Well I know uh, Brighton Marathon collect rubbish all day long um, throughout the route and also no different pride was visible or contactable during the event. Now, I'm only taking that as it is in this document here. Um, I'm hoping somebody will be able to tell me if those points, or some of those points, are not exactly true. Um, I, th I think we all welcome pride. It's a really um, great weekend. Um, <laughs> And I think if there are any issues, uh, there should be time to discuss and resolve most of those before COVID takes place. Thanks. I think Ian wants to come in and uh, just say a few words. Yeah, I'm, I would be very disappointed if any of those were, were wholly true. That, that's, a, that's a dreadful thing. I mean, people should be assured that Pride is probably the single most scrutinised and reviewed events that we have in the city. You know, from the, from the moment it finishes, uh, there are debriefs right the way through to the planning operation, which virtually starts the day afterwards, and colleagues are all sitting up and quite shaking their heads. Um, but it is reviewed by belts and braces, so it gets reviewed on an operational level, then it goes higher up the chain to the safety advisory group. So all of those things that have been spoken about, about people not being present, about stewards not being briefed, those, those would be dreadful things for events, and I would hope they would be teased out at debriefs and then reviewed for the following year. Thanks very much. Um, yes, sir. Um, Ian, can I just ask about uh, no rubbish collectors during the event? Is that not correct? It, it isn't correct, no. They, they do an extra, uh, an awful lot of work with City Clean, uh, which is paid for at the expense of uh, Pride CIC. So that just, uh, you know, there's always going to be isolated pockets. There's going to be, you know, it's a major city event that will have a number of anecdotal stories like that, and our job is to reduce them. But um, no, there's lots of litter collections. Yeah, please do, Jane. Um, and I, I know that um, Jane from Pride is there constantly throughout the whole of the PVP event um, and is contactable. Um, so that handouts are given to residents so that they have contact details so that if there are issues that they can be addressed at the time. So um, again, there's always a representative from Pride and as um, Councillor Marsh has mentioned, um, there are council officers there throughout the event as well. Are we sending these comments back to the King's Gift Society? Um, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't planned to, but uh, if that's the direction of committee, then I'm happy to do so. Uh, yeah, cool. um, appendix one is actually um, refers to the 2017 event. It was presented to Council on the 19th of April 2018, so it wouldn't refer to the 18 event. 
so you would think that most of those issues have been picked up. It's a bit confusing, it's not clear in the appendix one. Yeah. Okay. Is that okay, Anne? Yeah, I think. It, yeah, okay. Okay, um, Phelan. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to reflect on the comments from Councillor Mears, I, I know several people who live in the vicinity of the event, um, someone on Camelford Street, someone on Manchester Street, and someone on St James's Street, and actually they really look forward to this event every year. Um, they, 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 they very much consider it as a, as a big day to have a great party with all their friends and so on and so forth. And their experience, as I've seen it through their eyes, is that a number of the points that have been made um, to this particular deputation just simply aren't accurate. I'm, I'm glad uh, Ian and Joe have been here to help outline from the City Council's point of view, but I know full well because I've seen it with my own eyes. There is street cleaning happening. Yes, of course there is. Um, yes, there are rubbish collectors during the event. Um, there are several people from Pride Visible. I know that I spotted one of them at the back of the room on, on the Sunday at the street party. So um, there's an awful lot of um, the things that are um, within some of the representations here that quite simply are, are a bit inaccurate. And actually, um, I think they potentially derail what we should be all focusing on, which is how we make this event safer and how we make it better and how we make it even more inclusive and how we make sure that this sort of hallmark event um, is fit for the future. And one of the things, and I know that I'll, I'll look to the Pride organisers at the back of the room, and they'll know that I always bang on about this point, is, and the one, the one criticism I suppose I always have about the street party, is just the quantity of single-use plastic cups that are everywhere. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I've made a continuous appeal about is that we engage one of the brewers or one of the big companies can brand these things and we can have what you get whenever you go to any of the big European festivals or that you get to Glastonbury, you get one cup, you fill it up, it's reusable and at the end of the day you keep the cup as a souvenir of the event and you cut down massively on the amount of waste uh, in the street. So that will be my appeal. I'll, I'll probably be approaching some of the, um, the, the big companies in the city myself, because I just think this is, a, this is an open goal. I imagine it's something that there's actually quite a lot of political unanimity around as well, uh, not least because, of course, of the environmental impact. And, and just the, the fact that... It, it's again coming back to, the, to my previous point about making this uh, a future-proof event and making it uh, an event that's even more inclusive, even even broader, and, and I think that um, we can all be as proud as possible of it as, after all, pride. Thank you, sir. Thanks very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to allow Mary, although you spoke, to just come back on the point. Very, very quickly, just to say, actually, I've got friends that live down there as well, councillors, so I know it very, very well very well. I just wanted to make one comment and I think it's important for all of us is we are an inclusive city. That's all of us. So if there are concerns raised from a different side of the community and we need to address it, surely that is better pride because residents can hear, see and hear that if they've got a concern it's listened to and it also means that pride can uh, and I do, I do support it being in St James Street. I'd have real nervousness if it was down on the seafront. It could be horrendous. And I just think we need to, there needs to be a balance to understand if, if there are concerns raised. I, I just don't like, quite like the negativity of them, them and us. And we are an inclusive city and we shouldn't be voicing it quite that way because it's important that we address it as a whole. And I believe, you know, I've been to many, many Pride events, mm -hmm. and I think by listening and thinking, well, perhaps we might do that better, actually enhances Pride even more so. So thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Mary. OK, so I think we're all done. Jolly good. Um, does the committee agree the recommendations as detailed in the report? Thanks very much. And moving on. Now, we, we now come to the outdoor event strategy, so would we like to take five, ten minutes to... Five minutes? Five minutes. Um, OK.
Can we all take our seats again if we can? Let us reconvene. Can I call for quiet in the public gallery, please? Order. I shall have you all removed. I might have you removed anyway. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, so we're moving on to the outdoor event strategy. And I'm, I'm aware that at times it might look like I don't know what I'm doing here. And that's probably because I don't know what I'm doing here. But we'll move, we'll move on with it anyway. So firstly, um, I think we're, we're going to take the, uh, the officer's report from, from Ian. And then we'll move on to the... Um, uh, uh, green notice, uh, green group motion. So, Ian, if you'd like to kick off. Thank you, Chair. Um, Brighton and Hove has a, a very strong outdoor events programme which plays a significant contribution to the city's visitor economy. Members are being asked to approve uh, in this report the adoption of the outdoor events strategy, which is uh, attached in Appendix 1, which has been developed in recent months, including a public consultation exercise. There was a good number of consultation responses received for a document of this nature. A summary of those responses attached in Appendix 2, with the structured questions used to assist with the consultation in Appendix 3. The cover report provides a brief overview of the key aspects of the strategy, including the benefit of events, the vision, objectives of the strategy, uh, the SWOT analysis of the current programme, and key actions. The key actions uh, being to provide greater focus for the programme, introduce an outdoor events charter, develop capacity building in the outdoor events sector, and enhance events infrastructure. In general, the consultation uh, responses were very positive with regards to the proposed strategy. While considerable work has been taken in recent years to improve the sustainability of events, the consultation feedback has been recognised and a further objective included in, on the sustainability of events. In addition, the sustainability requirements enhanced in the Charter and those proposed in the draft strategy that went out for consultation. Uh, I'm aware that there's a, a detailed amendment for it to be considered, so I think I'll conclude the introduction at that point. Thanks very much, Ian. So now um, we're going to ask Councillor Druitt to move the Green Notice a motion. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, uh, I think it's fair to say that the outdoor events in this city are um, often the highlight of my year. I look forward to each one of them, um, and it's one of the main things that Brighton has to offer, I think, such a wide programme of different events uh, all across the city. Um, obviously, we've, we've discussed Pride in some detail already, and uh, we've got the Brighton Festival coming up in, in a couple of months. But one thing that we as ward councillors, and I'm sure uh, many of us have the same experience, is that we have a lot of complaints at the end of an event uh, about either noise or rubbish or the state of the grass after an event or, you yeah, know, and so on and so forth. So um, we're proposing an amendment with a number of... Uh, kind of detailed items and each one is for a particular reason that uh, you know, has come up in, in discussions with residents uh, and we hope that through these amendments we enhance the events that happen in the city and uh, create more of uh, a better working relationship between the events and local residents. So we are asking that the, uh, we adopt the outdoor event strategy as uh, a, appendix in uh, appendix one and support key actions and then instruct officers to prepare a report for the next tourism development and culture committee which considers the implications of amending the outdoor events strategy as set out in A and B below. So the first thing is to introduce an environmental impact charge 
This was requested in, by respondents in the consultation in the report we have before us today, and it has already been successfully applied in Oxford. Uh, and we hope that it would fund maintenance and care of the spaces used, including support for friends of groups, uh, parks and, and open spaces associations. Uh, then we would like to request that all outdoor events on council-owned land sign up to the outdoor events charter, irrespective of physical numbers. The report today recommends that uh, events over 500 people sign up to the charter, but considering the charter is not legally binding anyway, um, it, and it makes, you know, it, it does make a lot of good points, and uh, there, there doesn't seem to be any reason why smaller uh, events shouldn't sign up to the charter. Um, and then, as, as part of the ongoing review of higher charges and fees, consideration is given to options for a fairer way of calculating charges, such as aligning them with commercial event income or attendance figures. This came up when we were looking at some of the charges last year. Um, it did seem a little bit unfair in some cases where events were charged different amounts without any clear rationale behind it. Um, and it seemed... It seemed, it might not always be the case, but it, it just seemed like some events had managed to uh, bargain their way to a better deal than others. So we would like to see something clearer. Um, and then finally, that a transport plan is de developed for large events that makes provision for maintaining access to sustainable, transports, su sustainable transport corridors during the event where practicable and agreed by the safety advisory group and encourages access to events via sustainable transport in line with a sustainable event commitment. And this was raised really because of feedback, especially about the Madeira Drive cycle lane, which we discussed last year, um, and you know the, the discussion we had about possibly rerouting it or um, making more of an effort to maintain those kind of accessible, uh, sustainable transport corridors that are so uh, well used. And then, furthermore, we hope to amend the Outdoor Events Charter as follows, to discourage the use of performing animals in events on council-owned land, a commitment to reduce waste creation at source, a commitment to the Brighton Living Wage, a commitment to comply with key Brighton Hove City Council corporate commitments as they affect communities such as policies developed in relation to licensing and environmental health. Then we would like to amend the sustainable events commitment for outdoor events to require event organisers to find alternatives to single-use plastics where possible. As my colleague, Councillor McCafferty, mentioned earlier, it's one of the, the really heartbreaking things about some of the bigger events, like the Pride Village Party, um, but also uh, the, the half marathon a year ago got a lot of publicity for the amount of plastic on the beach afterwards. And as a result, the half marathon this year made a huge effort and made a big difference to change that. So it can be done and they should be congratulated for doing it, and we like to see uh, all, all events um, follow their lead. And finally, to request that this committee receives annual feedback on compliance with the Outdoor Events Charter, with a presumption against granting future landlords consent to events that show clear disregard for the Charter. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Councillor McCafferty to second the motion. Thank you, Chair. Um, my colleague has already covered a number of the salient points. Um, I would like to point out that in the outdoor event strategy, we talk about Oxford as a comparator, and I, I have their document here, um, which outlines exactly how they deal with events and, and indeed why we want to introduce um, environmental impact fees as well as uh, administration fees. Um, Oxford for their commercial events in their city parks um, has a non-refundable environmental impact fee um, of between 500 and 1,000 pounds and it, has a, it is an administration fee, again non-refundable um, for a commercial event of 100 pounds. Um, we're looking at them in the document as a comparator so, so I think it's, it's evidence there that um, they're, they're doing it and they're doing it 
quite successfully. I think what I'd also like to comment on is that what we're actually doing here, um, especially with the call for the environmental impact chart, is actually just reflecting what was what came about as a result of the consultation, and we're, the, the report is riddled with references to public, strong public support for uh, the introduction of an environmental impact charge. Paragraph 3.8, desire to introduce an environmental impact charge. Paragraph 3.14, uh, desire to introduce an environmental impact charge. Paragraph 3.18, uh, main responses were to introduce an environmental impact charge. Paragraph 3.20, highest number of open responses to the open question was the introduction of an environmental impact charge. Paragraph 4.1, environmental impact charge to be recommended to be included in the draft strategy. So I think I'm making my point that um, if we're going to be faithful to the consultation responses, then what we should be doing is including an environmental impact charge. Um, and I think that's one of the key calls um, of our, our uh, Green Group amendment for the event today. Um, I think I'll leave it there, um, but I think the amendment, uh, despite perhaps its length, uh, is actually very clear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to invite comments from the committee members. Anybody want to say anything? Nancy. Um, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, I, I did have a bit of a concern about an environmental impact charge, only in that whilst I understand the concept of the polluter pays, it's always worried me, particularly around climate change levies, that people think then they can just do whatever they want because they're paying for it. So that, that was kind of my only worry about that. Um, but as, as you said, there's a lot of references to it throughout the report. Um, I, I, would, I would really welcome um, that um, any money that, that is generated it supports friends of groups for our parks and open spaces, particularly with the sort of ongoing cuts. I, I'm finding more and more residents are coming to me saying they'd like to take over spaces or be responsible, and I'm very heartened by the community response on the tidy up teams and everything else. But they do need some support and structure sometimes because they feel like they need someone to go to and they need other people around them to help maintain parks. So I particularly wel welcome that in my ward where I'm seeing quite a demand for it. Um, and I'd also um, feel that the amendment to the Charter would be um, a good way of setting out our expectations of people wanting to have outdoor events in the city. I think actually setting out a stall and saying that's what we expect, that's our minimum standard, would be a really, really good thing to do. Um, as you know, I'm a big fan of public transport, so the more we can include public transport in our transport plan and make sure people understand how to use local buses, I think that's really important. Um, I think when people come to a strange city, it's much harder for them to work out which local buses to use because they don't know the names of places and which direction they're going in, and anything we can do to improve people's experiences so they feel comfortable using public transport and they're going to get where they want to be would be very welcome. Um, we've covered a lot of the other stuff in other discussions, but as you know, the Brighton Living Wage is very close to my heart, so um, absolutely, if we can get a commitment to anybody using our space to be paying the Brighton Living Wage, that would be very welcome as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to comment? No? No? Okay. Oh, sorry, Joe, I've got you written down as well. Yeah, it's because you, you were both being so quiet. So, so. Well, that's so, online. Joe. Yeah, it's unusual. So. Um, um, no, I, I, uh, I th yeah, thank you, uh, Ian, for the report. I think it's very comprehensive and um, very detailed, and I agree with it in, in, in its entirety. Um, we'll be supporting it. Um, however, I don't think our group will be supporting the, um, the amendment, namely because um, whilst it's only asking for a report, uh, an environmental impact charge has problems that Councillor Flax has already set out, but it is a, a, a tax by stealth on some of the um, key things that bring tourism into our city, in, our, in my view anyway, um, and, and it makes those outdoor events potentially less viable, um, which we wouldn't want to see. And namely, you know, I agree with some of the parts of the, some of the, parts of the amendment, like the, um, the maybe looking at the, the, the hire and charges and the transport plans and things like that and the commitments to, to, the, to the change to the outdoor events structure. But, but, then, the, but then a point E to requ request this 
request that this committee receives annual feedback on the compliance with the charter, with a pres presumption against granting future permission to events that show a clear disregard for the charter. Uh, firstly, I don't know how you establish what a clear disregard of the charter was, but also I would be very concerned that some of the established events that are struggling more to comply with the charter, or that might, might find it financially difficult to comply with it, are then going to be punished. And they are very successful events that residents enjoy and that tourists enjoy. So I think there are a number of um, sort of effects maybe which haven't been thought out as a result of this amendment, and so um, I would be supporting it. <coughs> Thanks very much, Robert. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Chair. I think, I think sometimes, I, I mean, I've take, taken forward just what Joe said. I like the principle of the, um, the, the agenda item, but I'm, I'm not keen on the amendment. I think the Council should always intervene when it sees a problem growing uh, and starting to run away, such as um, uh, party houses. You know, it, came, it was a new trend. It, it, it's, it's got out of hand. The Council needs to get on top of it, or the government, whatever, and pull it back. If we'd have heard some ex examples of events that, that this would have applied to, uh, I'd be more inclined to support it, but I've mentioned a couple of events today. So four events today seem to have been mentioned. Pride, let's get any, any problem that you can come up with Pride, I reckon is getting better. Uh, I mentioned the Brighton half, and that's a key one because it was at the Brighton half last year that there was an international outrage at the number of plastic bottles bobbing around in the sea, and quite rightly so. And they absolutely turned it round to the point where it's an event that could be now held up as, as an example of how things should be done. Zippo Circus was mentioned. I mean, Zippos have uh, voluntarily, under pressure, stopped bringing animals, certainly for this year only. And I mentioned Lagoon Fest, which is an event over Lagoon where we left it cleaner um, than, when it, than when the event started. So, in the absence of any events where it, any sort of disasters have, have occurred, I think the events team and the council policy generally is taking us in the right direction. I don't think we need to be intervening because there's many other problems that we could be getting on top of instead. So I'm happy to support the main item, but the, the, the amendment um, is fixing a problem that's on the mend anyway and is creating bureaucracy. Thank you. Okay, Mary? Yes, Mary. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, as, as with my colleagues, I won't be supporting the Green Amendment. I don't, I don't know what Oxford charge for... Um, sorry? No, I don't need it now, it's too late. But I, this is in your amendment, and you've just, you just put a, uh, another a city in without any real detail. So, and I, and I actually think this, is, this, this amendment could actually um, be very detrimental to a strategy. It's a strategy. A strategy should be open and, and flexible, but you can work a strategy. This is very, very precise. And actually, I think it's damaging towards any strategy. And as we know, as councillors, we have many, many strategies within this council, um, which take up many, many pages. And I think we need to be very careful what exactly is the purpose of this strategy. It's to be open and fluid. If you go through um, some of the, it's a vision, it's um, and a way it's going to come forward, and it talks around. Um, provide greater strategic focus on the, to the outdoor events. So it, it's got a strategy about working across the, the events of the city. And, and my view on these amendments actually goes absolutely the opposite way. It's very precise. And I think by incorporating that into a strategy, you actually are in danger of stifling any strategy going forward. So I wouldn't be supporting it. Um, on the actual, um, I just wanted to ask a question, if that's okay, through to the officers, on, on the report and outdoor, because I, I get quite confused with how the council loves to gather information. So up to page uh, 160, I'm absolutely fine with it. I understand the questions. It's all about outdoor events and how they would actually, you know, people would be engaged with them. Then I get slightly lost when you start from page 161, because... When I go to an event, I don't, my religion is my religion. I, you know, I'm not quite sure how that relates to when I go to an outdoor event. And I just find some of the information in there 
a petrol officer will tell me why it needs to be collated because it has a massive impact on outdoor events. But I can't, from one page, page 60 onwards, I'm not quite sure how that relates to outdoor events. I, I, I'm quite happy to be, you know, advised as to why that's important, but I don't see it. Would you like to respond, Dean and Wayne? Well, go on, go on. Uh, thank you, uh, councillors. Um, it was part of the standards um, um, consultation. It was uh, developed in, 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 uh, with our uh, Office of Colleagues. Um, so it started the sort of the standard process for a questionnaire that goes out as part of the uh, council um, consultation process. Um, so that's why um, those particular um, questions are included in that. So it's, it's not just unique to this particular consultation for the outdoor event strategy. It's, it's something that is consistently applied when the council undertakes um, using the, the, the online portal. Um, yeah, please say. Yes. Um, come up, I, I understand the council per se has this, is this research question there. But if I'm a visitor or, or, or you know, with a family and I, and I think all oh, the council is really interested in what I think about outdoor event strategy, because it is about outdoor events, I'm not sure if I've got the rest of this, this survey, but I think, do you know what, I'm not filling it in. Because I, I don't, I understand where the council is with its format and what it does. It's been a councillor for a very long time. I just don't see how, from page 160 onwards, it relates. If you're trying to gather information for people, visitors or people using outdoor events, how that equates to actually a the number of responses because would I get would I keep going and keep going and keep going to fill all those questions in and actually when you process it how they relate to um, the strategy around how it works I, I don't quite see that I'm sure there's a very relevant answer but I just I don't see it and knowing people, public, and that, you know, the less paperwork there is, they'll go tick, 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 box, lovely, done it. You get pages and pages as they fill in the questionnaire and they go, well, might do that later. And you don't get the responses you're really looking for. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, Anne. Thank you, Chair. Um, like my colleagues who have spoken earlier, I won't be supporting the Green Group Amendment, but I did want just to raise um, a point about little two, no, little one in B. Now, I, I don't like to see any animal performing in the circus, um, but I do wonder about the future of animals normally used in circuses if, if we're going to decide that we'll see less of them in circus performances. So that's just, just a worry for me probably, but I wonder if there's any thoughts on, on the, the sort of ongoing life of animals which would normally be used in, in circus performances. I, I think one of the important things to remember, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that when we call for a report, the report might actually come back and say that none of this is practical and none of it is, is able to happen. So we are, we're not deciding anything here, we're deciding to have a report on these things. So it, it's not as if we're saying now that this is going to happen. So I think, you know, it's safe to to support the amendments to bring a report forward uh, rather than um, rather than you know it's, it's, it's not stuff we're deciding on. Tom would you like to come in? Uh, thank you Chair. I, I'd just like to remi remind members of the committee we had last April where um, interestingly we had a, a complete opposite going on here. Um, we had Labour members saying this was a waste of officers' time, and we had Conservative members reminding Labour members that we were only asking for a report, and we had mm. councillors Nemeth and Mears um, supporting the amendment, which called for 
the environmental impact charge to be investigated in a report. Exactly what is being asked for this today. No, it's not. But the vast majority of what's in this amendment, including the things that you've spoken against, was in a report, sorry, was in the amendment a year ago, which was supported by the Conservative group. So, <laughs> um, I welcome the support of Labour. Thank you. And um, it's a shame that the Conservatives have uh, done a U-turn on this and are making the exact same arguments against the amendment that they were criticising Labour members of doing a year ago. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, did you want to make a quick point, Joe? Because, it, it, you know, we, I think... Yeah, just, on, just on that, this is a, if this is, I saw that amendment. It's entirely different amendments yeah, to that than was proposed. It is. There was, there was no... There was here. So, so was, was there an amendment to the outdoor events charge, charter, which included that with the presumption against granting future and permission to events to show clear disregard for the charter? I don't believe there was, uh, Councillor McCafferty, and I think the, the consultation responses are an orchestrated campaign from Green members in order to support this stealth attack. Right. We'll be okay. voting against the amendment, because it's a waste of lots of time even drafting up a report. Right, well, does the committee, have we all finished? Nobody else wants to say anything. No, that's, that's a good thing. Right, so, um, does the committee agree the recommendations as detailed in the report as amended? Sorry. All right, we've got to put the, we've got to put the note at the, the, I did tell you I might not understand what's going on here. We might, we've got to put the notices of motion to, to the vote. So, uh, all those in favour? Okay. And those against? Right. <laughs> I think, I think, um, yeah, six, six, four, yeah, yeah. I think we know that, yeah. So, so now to, uh, uh, so now, now we're going to vote on the recommendations as amended. Uh, are all those in favour? And those against? <laughs> okay. So I think we know where we are with that. And, and thanks very much to, to, to Ian and Ian. And I, I, I expect you'll go straight away and start on that, Ian. Will you? <laughs> Good. So moving on, we move to, I believe. Um, yeah, that's right. Yes. Uh, update on Royal Pavilion and Museums. It's Janita. Okay, bye. Are we already? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you okay, Janita? Ready when you are. Yeah. Right. Um, thank you, Chair. In January, um, TDC agreed that an advisory group be established to support the Royal Pavilion and Museums during a period of change as requested by Arts Council England. Um, as members will be aware, our major funder of the Royal Pavilion and Museums. It was also agreed that the report would be brought back to TDC today. Um, um, informing councillors of who has been appointed. Um, they are named in the report at 3.2 um, and their backgrounds are given. So four external people have been appointed. It was also agreed that the report would um, be coming back for the, approve, for the approval of the appointment of the chair. And this report recommends that the chair of TDC is appointed as the chair of the Royal 
Royal Pavilion and Museums Advisory Group. And the report goes on to remind of um, the other people that will be on this advisory group. So representative of Arts Council England, um, there's um, going to be a staff representative and also um, a union, union representation on it. And just to finally remind it, this is about an advisory group. It isn't about governance. Thank you. Thank you, Janita. Um, do we have any comments from the committee members? Uh, Robert, sorry. Uh, it's, it's a question. I think that the 2.2 uh, the on page 167, the 3.3 overly, is perhaps ambiguously worded because I think it's meant to be whoever the chair of TDC yeah. of the day is. Yeah. I'm sure okay. Councillor Robbins will be chair of TDC forever, but uh, he yeah, wasn't. Sorry. Um, I think the wording needs to be uh, tweaked here, because um, with respect, 2.2 .2 should probably say chair of the day or something similar, and 3.3, .3, well, also to be modified accordingly, I believe. I think I'll leave it. So the content of the report doesn't really matter because what you're agreeing is 2.1 to 2.2. .2. So perhaps with your agreement, with the committee's agreement, we could change it to approve the appointment of the, the current chair of the TDC committee as the chair of the RPA and G. Well, I help. I mean, I actually totally agree with <coughs> with colleagues over there. With respect to you, chair, no dispute. The issue is the role. The role is the chair of TDC. You actually don't need to mention Councillor Robbins by name at all. You certainly don't need to be adding current into 2.2. .2. Just, I, I would guess, I mean, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, <coughs> that 2.2 .2 should just say approves the appointment of the chair, the chair of TDC as the chair of whatever, and that 3.3, .3, again, it is proposed that the chair of the RPMAG is chair, 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 chair of the chair, isn't there, by the, the chair of TDC, whoever that is, that's, I mean, you know, whatever. It, it, it's an ongoing, it needs to go ongoing, doesn't it, whatever happens, because all our roles change as we move on and through, and Alan's got a great role coming up, which will mean he won't get to be chair of TDC, because yeah. he'll be something wonderful. Oh, 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 sorry, what was it? I'm only being no, facetious. Um, I am on still from, in the room, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on from what Lo said, um, perhaps also because don't forget that we changed the name of this committee. Uh, yes. I know, so it could say the TDC or its successor. Yes, that's something like that. Whoever, whichever whatever is. is yeah, because right. I don't know how long this particular group is. Is it, is it a task and finish or is it a long term? No, yeah. it'll be, it'll be when, when, when we're ready to move to trust. When we're ready to move to trust, then this, yeah. this, this, this advisory committee will, will cease to be. So, should we, do you think we could, if we could change it to that? So, it's chair of TDC or, or it's a proper appropriate committee, whatever that may be. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. otherwise, you have to keep yeah. bringing it back to the committee. So, yeah. so I know I'm um, a bit tired, but that was my contribution. Yeah. All right. Mary. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to thank Janita for the report. I, th I think after the turbulence we've been through with, um, you know, with the pavilion and, and staff, I think this is probably a good way forward. It's advisory, it's to set the scene as to where things could go. My only concern is on 3.4. Is and I welcome the way forward. I think it's a really good idea, but nowhere in there does it say a future report back to committee, and I think that's important. Good point. Thank you. Did you? In terms of the. Uh, so in terms of the project and the progress we're making, good progress that we're making in terms of preparing to move the Royal Pavilion Museums to trust, that will absolutely come back, it will come back through this committee. Um, yeah, the, the, the reason, I'm very happy for that to be recorded in the minutes, the, the important thing is that this is an advisory group in relation to the period before we move to trust. Um, there will be, this, this report is not, and it's deliberately, it, it doesn't cover 
actually moving to trust, there will be a whole set of papers that will come to you through this committee and then on to other committees um, that will include the proposed arrangements to move to trust and all of the associated documents um, as, as we're required to do. So we've, we've deliberately, because this is not, this group will be looking at how we manage museums now not how we manage museums in the future. So we tried to not conflate those two issues. But I can absolutely reassure you, no. we will be coming back to committee. Sorry, Jeff, back on that. And I totally understand what you're saying as an officer sure. to bring this forward, but you have to remember we have local elections. We don't know what members, new members, will be picking up reports and reading. So there needs to be some continuity in there. Doesn't matter how you word it as, as openly as you word it, it's just there needs to be, because if I was a new member and coming, I go, well, I'm going to be on that, I'll see what their last meeting said. I go, well, what's happening then? You, you just, I, I totally have to take on board what you're saying. Any other time in the four year cycle, it probably, but we, we don't know what we don't know, and it needs to have some clarity around it. So, so from, from, so from, from an officer perspective, absolutely fine to put as much clarity as you wish. Um, officers do not have delegated authority to move the Royal Pavilion Museums to trust. We have, we have authority to prepare to do so. So we absolutely will be coming back. Even if there's a, even if there's a, a change of administration, that, that still stands, that decision still stands. Sorry. However, I'm just saying, I'm just to point of clarification. So in terms, of, I am happy for, from an officer perspective for you to suggest any form of wording that reinforces that decision that's already been made. It isn't a question about reinforcing, it's just, it's just to show continuity through a report so whoever comes forward as new members, if they're following this, they go, oh, an advisory board was set up and this is going to be a way for... It can be as loose as you like, but it, can't, it needs to have something in there. Okay. So, so if, if, if through you, the chair, if we, if we just take five minutes to, because one of the things we can do is add, add an additional recommendation just to know that there'll be further reports coming back. Um, but I think that we also just want to make sure that we clarify the point about um, the chair of this committee or successor committee um, being, being the person uh, that, that will be chairing the advisory group. Alice is just drafting something. Yeah, it's about five minutes. And, and, uh, I mean, we hope that this um, advisory committee will be as short-lived as possible. Because if it, if we get on with, no, no, but we, if 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 the quicker we move to trust, the, the less time that the, this um, this this committee, uh, this uh, group, will be in uh, in place. Yeah. 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 Um, just, one just a point that may be helpful is that there used to be an advisory group um, for, and this was because it's always been a request of the Arts Council basically to be overseeing the business plan that, that delivers it and they wanted it reinstated um, so that it's sort of, you know, coming back, they wanted it when you know, the shadow board was disbanded. They asked for the shadow board to, you know, get rid of, in effect, not for them to get rid of, but the advisory group that existed. We don't need that anymore. So, sort of coming full circle. On that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Welcome, Mr. Scott. Just for you, I'm just saying the words need to be can be as loose as they like. Just to say, you know, it will be it will be ongoing. Even if it just says ongoing, and, and members will be informed anything, because we've got local elections. Can I just ask as well, does anybody want to ask any other questions? Because I'm very conscious that people are suffering uh, various um, sort of plights and other people have... Um, yeah, she's suffering. So, so if, if anybody's got any other points or anything they want to make while we sort this out, then let's do it now. But um, if not, we're okay. Okay. Apparently we're ready now, so I'll hand over to the so The proposal for recommendation 2.2 .2 is that it reads, 
approves the appointment of the serving chair of the TDC committee or relevant committee as the chair of the RPAMG. Okay. So, um, I, I, I then propose that we accept the recommendations as detailed in the report. Does the committee agree? Sorry. Um, so, what you actually agree is the recommendations, the content of the report does inform those recommendations, but you're making absolutely explicit in 2.2 that that's. Okay. 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 So can we then, have we got to alter anything else or are we ready to go? Yeah. We're ready to go then. So I propose accepting the recommendations as detailed in the report. Does the committee agree? Yeah. Jolly good. I have Right, so we're moving on. Thanks very much, Janita. Okay, thanks again. Uh, procurement of the Brighton Centre hosted ticketed system and it's held. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report um, provides the committee with background information on the procurement of the hosting ticketing system for the Brighton Centre. Um, we seek to invite bidders to respond to an invitation to tender for the provision of a hosted ticketing system uh, for the venue uh, and that the committee gives delegated authority to the Executive Director of Economy, Environment and Culture to procure and award a contract for the hosted ticketing system for the centre for an initial term of five years with an option to extend for a further two years. The venue has an annual turnover of ticket sales in approximately £10 million, holding on average 90 live events per annum, attracting 250,000 ticket sales. The contract would be a concession agreement with a potential income value to the, to the council of approximately 300,000 per annum, which would equate to 2.1 million pounds over five years plus two years. The venue has operated a hosted ticketing service for the past 20 years. This form of ticketing operation and fulfillment is generally accepted as best industry practice. Um, by appointing a third party operator to provide a hosted ticketing system for the centre, it will allow the venue to continue to provide a fully supported international standard ticketing system which will continue to provide our customers with a seamless pro process when purchasing tickets. Thanks very much. Uh, have we any um, comments? Julie, I think you were first and, and Robert and then second. Thank you very much, Chair. A um, couple of things. Um, first of all, in, in the requirements for the new ticketing system, will there be something in place to prevent um, resale of tickets on um, you know, websites that charge double the, you know, the, the face value? You know the sort of thing I mean? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, there would no, be no um, process within that. That's a, people would purchase, individuals would purchase the tickets and then sell them on via go, go. We, we haven't got control beyond that point. There, there, is, there is on certain shows uh, by our artist request whereby uh, the ticket, the name of the purchaser has to be on the ticket and then that has to be verified uh, at, on entry of the venue. Now that is um, only happened on about five or six shows at the Brighton Centre. It's a fairly new thing. But um, you, know, you can see that the artists and promoters will probably drive, hopefully in the future, the reduction in that secondary market. And technology may influence that as well in the future. Mm, yeah, please do. The idea, one thing that sort of really annoys me about getting tickets is that they you know, you've got a thing this long, you've got four tickets, you've got the receipts, you're, you know, and then you've got this big ticket with, you know, thing. Um, and I know it's good to actually have a physical ticket in your pocket, but um, it would be really great if we could start sort of encouraging more on, you know, smartphone tickets and things as well. And I'm, I'm just hoping that that's somewhere in here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Robert. Thank you, Chair. Um, we're all aware that at some point it's not impossible that the Brighton Centre will be redeveloped. So the obvious um, thing to do would be to look at page 177, which has got yeah. the future of the Brighton Centre yeah. 
uh, item. Uh, target milestones is, uh, is pretty thin, though, so it doesn't really answer the questions on what would happen and when with regard to the, the Brighton Centre for perhaps going. So I'm sort of, it's a double item really, I'm saying it's a bit unhelpful on page 177 that the report, uh, uh, it's obviously the case it won't be, there must be something in place to, for our five year ticketing thing so that it doesn't conflict with the centre being knocked out, I'm sure of it, but it would be helpful to know what. Yeah, I'm, 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 uh, there would be contractual break clause in any contract that we would have. Um, sorry. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for the report. Um, I think you mentioned during your presentation that the previous contract was 20 years? Yes. Um, so I'm just wondering then how do you feel about five years? And then I suppose just at, at the moment, just given the, um, the way in which we're trying to understand and have more routine auditing systems for anything that we contract out. I suppose the, the big concern for me would be that we have a routine way of checking that this remains value for money over time so that when or if you get to the five year point, obviously you, you do renew or don't, but then obviously there are points before you get to the five year point where you can check that this is still something that uh, is worth um, the city investing in. Thank you. Okay, um, and Tom. Sorry, you did. Um, in, in terms of, I guess, when we, we enter into a five year, five year contract, we've entered that, we've gone through a process of uh, assessing best value at that moment in time. Um, you know, at the point that contract's awarded, it will, you know, we'll be able to assess what other other uh, operators are uh, uh, offering that, that you, know, op you know, us for that opportunity. So, uh, but, you know, I guess we'll probably have to go through another process to actually test market again. Okay. That makes sense, yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Tom. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think the arguments for uh, going out to tender are well made. Um, because of the numbers involved, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have such a high you know, capability in-house. Um, but I'm just wondering, what are the, the opportunities and risks that, are, that will come with new technologies? Um, Councillor Cantel mentioned new technology. Um, obviously, things are moving very quickly in that, in that area. And uh, we had a little discussion at Premi around the, the risk of um, you know, hacking into the system and so on, and lost revenue that way, or lost tickets, or um, something. And also, I just wondered, in terms of opportunities, you know, I, I was talking to somebody in who'd been to Switzerland recently, and they said that they had they got a ticket on a mobile phone that. Uh, when they went into the venue, it just, you know, the doorway uh, read that they had a ticket on their person and, uh, and they just walked straight in. So I just wondered if that kind of thing is something that we can offer in the future. Thank you. Um, with regard to any organisation which holds, um, um, you know, technical uh, data, um, there's always going to be a risk of... of, of uh, a breach, um, uh, no, no matter how strong their, their firewalls are. Um, in terms of our position on that, we, we, they would be the data processors, so therefore, in effect, the risk to us is, 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 is none. We would have a full data protection impact assessment done on this um, uh, uh, and any organisation that we would, would look to appoint. In terms of mobile ticketing, that technology is there. It is being used. For some reason, it's not being used um, in the entertainment industry as much as we would probably like. For some reason, I think people actually like the physical touch and feel of, of their ticket. Um, but we do have scanners. So all our tickets are scanned on entry at the, at the, at the Bryant Centre, irrespective of whether they're, they're a mobile phone or a ticket or a print at home. They're all barcoded and individual to that particular seat and purchase. Thanks very much. Uh, 
Do you want to come back? I'm, I'm just going to say that um, I still see people who put them on their notice, their pin boards, you know, sure tickets. Yeah, I would have, I'm sure. I'm sure um, Councillor Robbins, who went to see um, uh, uh, anybody, Steve anybody? Dan the other week. I'm sure you've got your ticket pinned up in your kitchen. Yeah, right? I, I go, and, I go, and, I turn up if somebody opens a fridge. <laughs> <laughs> Um, OK, so uh, I, I propose we accept the recommend de uh, recommendations as detailed in the report. Does the committee agree? Thanks very much. So we move on to finally the um, update on, uh, on, on major projects. And I'm very conscious that people are not well and we've got other things to go to. So, yeah, unless, unless, unless there's anything you want to ask, and I know, Anne, you're not feeling too good, so unless there's anything... There's, 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 there's no voting, but if anybody wants to... No, you can sit no, Go on, Max. Some people are leaving. They're, they're all going, that's all. Do you want to go, Joe? Or you want just, to on, go? just on the Madeira Terraces. Uh, just, I think every, certain people are going to go because they've, they've sort okay. of... Uh, OK. Are you going, then? Wait, that, it's, it's only in, yeah, if, if you need to get off. We won't be five minutes on it. Yeah, OK. If Anne's going. All oh, right, OK. So, oh. Joe, then Robert. Just on the future of Madeira Terraces that's outlined, um, I don't really understand what's... I mean, but is it now a phase development? It's now talking about 68 of the 151. Is that a new decision to phase the development? And then it also talks about... Um, target milestones, round one decision, December 2018, which I understand was, was negative, and then there's, there's talk or something in the press that the bid's going in in May for HLF, but, and then it says round two submission. Is that that submission that's going in in May? It's going to take over a year for HLF to decide. April 2020 is estimated, and that's just for phase one, which is anticipated to then start in 2021. My concern is that it's, this is dragging on and on and on. Okay, just, so just to clarify, um, in terms of the question about the phase, it, it's, it was always phased in terms of the initial HLF bid. It wasn't for the entire set of arches because that would have been too big a ask in one go. So that was for the, uh, the, the lower number. And I think, to be honest, I think this probably needs an update in terms of, so the plan was we would have bid, bid for that small amount and then put in a round two submission for a larger amount. Actually, the HLF bid has been unsuccessful anyway, so we now need to look at um, the revi there's a revised HLF um, bidding process that we'll be looking at, looking at again, but also looking at other options. Obviously, in the meantime, we will be continuing with the, um, the crowdfunded arches. Yeah, this doesn't mean updated. So, 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 so what it should say now is round one, May 2019, and then something like... December 2020 for round two submission with a start in probably 2022. I mean, my concern, my, I suppose my concern is, is that how the structural integrity of those arches every time I go along there is, get, is looking worse and worse and worse and there's bits, bit coming off and more and more stills being put underneath which are obviously expensive in their own right. Um, how, how long? How long? How long can this go on for? I mean, can we just keep relying on the HLF? To, I know there's another project out there which I think we had a presentation which I don't particularly support, but that box art thing, um, which looks madness to me. But um, um, is there is there an alternative proposal that the council are considering, maybe with its own asset portfolio, and how we can use that to enable development along there? Um, yeah, so we will obviously the HLF does exist to overcome um, a heritage gap, you know, a heritage viability gap. And so the HLF is the best source of, uh, the best way of, um, of doing it. Um, we've not been successful to date. I think in terms of these dates, they, they would change. So actually, we need to look at, you know, look at the new HLF funding um, uh, process, see how much is viable to bid for, and then that might change a couple of these dates on whether we have a second phase or we do do, do it in one phase. I think the other thing that we'll be doing in, in parallel is looking at what other options are there, and that, that is work that's ongoing around, um, you know, is there a business case to, to do something without using HLF money? Unfortunately, the work we've done today implies we do need some sort of gap funding to, to close that gap. Okay. Um, I think uh, I've got uh, Robert and then Tom and Mary. 
Thank you, Chair. It's a, it's a King Alfred question. <laughs> if, if you were a betting man, what odds would you offer on Press Nicholson oh, signing not fair. on the 30th of March? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not a betting man. Oh. Okay, Tom. What do you want, Hudson? Um, thank you. Just on, on that last question, um, I remember at the last meeting I suggested we had something about risks in some of these reports. And um, I, can't, I can't see it. I might have missed it, but I can't see it. Um, so just wondered if that's something that we could take forward. Um, and then a couple of questions. Uh, Preston Barrett, it's not a, a project we talk about very often in this committee, but it's great to see the work that's going on there. And um, it's, I've just been reading through the background here on page 180. Um, the scheme will create a northern gateway into the city and support entrepreneurial makers, inventors, engineers and product designers uh, with the use of diverse workspace. Uh, really exciting stuff. Um, I, I just wonder, in terms of, you know, if you were a, an entrepreneurial men, maker or an inventor, you probably don't have a lot of money until your idea or product has really taken off. So, is this... Is this something that they're going to have to pay to use, or is it something that the university is providing some kind of you know, community leg up to entrepreneurial inventors? Um, I just wondered if you could say something about that. And also, um, with the Madeira terraces, um, there was a bit of a hoo-ha month or so ago about the, uh, the actual arches that are planned to be renovated and I just wondered if, if we are renovating the arches that you know, are kind of in the middle of it yeah. quite near Concord 2 or are we renovating the arches that, well they're not really arches, they're, they're like units under the slope aren't they at the, at the pier end of it. Um, and I just, I know a lot of um, residents, crowdfunders and community groups have raised concerns about that approach. Um, my worry is that, I mean, I, I see why it makes sense to start at that direct, yeah, start that end. But um, are we not trying through this exercise to find out what's involved in renovating the, the actual open arches? And are we not in danger, if we don't spend the money on doing exactly that, of missing that opportunity to find out what's involved and what the costs are? Thank you. Well, I, I can say that there was a question coming to this committee today about which arches we're going to... Uh, the, the question has decided that they would like to bring that to full council at the end of the month. I tried to contact them because that seemed to me to be... A, 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 an odd thing to do because at full council all that will happen is it will get referred back to TDC so it'll, it won't come back to us till June whereas we could have perhaps had the discussion today but um, I, I understand that the, the conversations are ongoing on that uh, and I say it may, it may have been better had the question come to us today we could have dealt with it today rather than there's a, a, the, the sort of converted route it will now take but sorry, Max, I'll, I'll leave you to. Uh, just to confirm what the chair was saying, there will be a more detailed response um, when when that does come back here. But f fundamentally, yes, we we have been looking at the, the westernmost arches. We're conscious the um, that the crowdfunding uh, community have, have a view on where they want it. We're not um, we're not drawing lines in the sand. It's, it's it's an ongoing discussion, but we will bring a more detailed report on that. Um, on the point around the was. Um, What's called the uh, Central Research Laboratory? It's changing its branding. I can't. Is it, I can't remember what it's changing it to. But it, it's it, as it as it opens, there'll be a lot more kind of publicity about exactly how it operates. This is at, at Preston Barracks. Um, obviously, it's, it's up to the, the the operators as to the the exact model that they that they operate. But we do know that certainly what they're looking to do is um, there will be kind of. Uh, 
kind of high-tech machinery that wouldn't be available to um, small businesses to use to kind of test proof of concept and kind of um, prototype things, they, they would have to pay for that. But what they obviously won't have to pay for is the actual capital cost of some of the machinery. So they'll, they'll have a cost, but it will be, be kind of much more manageable. So um, obviously that's, we'll, we'll find out more about that concept as it, as it emerges, but it's um, supportive of LEP funding and it is all about, it's like incubation space, but for people who kind of make things. Um, first one was your question on the risks. You, you are right. I think, yes, you did mention it. It was never going to be a full risk register for each and every project. We were going to flag up new risks um, when and as they arose, and that hasn't made it. So, for example, the Brexit kind of questions that arose that um, PRG would have, yeah, should have made it onto the, um, the uh, King Alfred one. So, apologies. We'll do that next time. Thanks so much, Mary. Chair, so, mind a very quick question on Madeira Terrace. Um, the estimated uh, project value is 24 million, but that was last uh, cost estimated in 2016. And bearing in mind the complexities of Madeira Terrace, and, and when I do know from previous, previous, when we looked at some of the railings at the top that need to be placed in the cast size, and those sections are nearly 10,000 each section. To, and I just wondered when that's going to be, it's three years ago, when that's going to be reviewed, because I think we do need to keep constant, up-to-date um, cost uh, basis, because we, we, otherwise we won't know exactly where we're going with it. And I think the points Councillor Drake made are interesting, but there's a cost, so we need to know where we are. Um, yeah, I agree. Obviously, on any heritage project, um, costs are a big risk. Um, you have to build in a much larger contingency, for example. Uh, fundamentally, it's part of the purpose of the crowdfunded arches, is that will give us some sense of um, what the actual costs are. And obviously, you know, the economy is a scale on doing it across more, but um, we, it'll give us a better, better stick. Sorry, just mm. You're absolutely right, because I know that figure and the figure that was mentioned for what could buy ago don't balance up, so I think we need to have more realistic cost values there. Thank you. Okay. Right, is everyone content? Everyone's asked all they want to ask anything? Right, well, it's uh, just uh, falls to me to thank everybody for their help and their comment today. Sorry, it doesn't fall to me to do that. What's it fall to me to do this? Ah, is there any items to go to full council? No? Okay. Well, then it falls to me to thank everybody for their input today and over the last few months. Um, and just to say what a pleasure really it's been to, to, to chair this for the last few months and thanks to John and um, Alice and have you? <laughs> I, well I was just going to start then about the Madeira Terraces but um, no thank you okay thanks Ray good night Thank <laughs> you.